all attendees are in listen only mode. See you later. Oh, Mr. Chair. I Sorry, I was hear. on mute. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, so calling to order Historic Landmarks Commission, April 29th, 2020. So we'll start with the roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Heidi Rydell. I'll be taking roll. Chair Grumbine. Present. Vice Chair House. I'm here. Commissioner Drury. Here. Commissioner Edmonds. Present. Commissioner Lundvik. Here. Commissioner Mayhan. Here. Commissioner Uli. Present. Commissioner Vania. Commissioner Vania, are you able to unmute yourself and let us know that you're here? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much. <coughs> that is the end of roll call. All commissioners are present. All right. Great. Okay. So we'll start with our general business, public comment. Any member of the public may address the commission for up to two minutes on any subject um, that is uh, not scheduled on this agenda. So if you would like to make public comment, please, please raise your virtual hand as the, as the, as the menu shows there. And Mr. Oh. Chair, this is Ellen Kokenda. Um, I do not see anyone who's raised their hand at the moment for general public comment. So back to you. Sorry, Commissioner Edmonds, will you raise your hand? Yes, sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, this is me speaking, I guess, as a member of the public. There was an accident on um, APS, and if you can imagine you are driving towards Montecito on APS and there's sort of a fork in the road uh, where Arbolado goes up the Riviera. And there's an altar rail wall there that has been hit and severely damaged just recently. Um, so um, I know that, that uh, they're not officially structures of merit, but I think we should report it to somebody. Um, the stone is not broken. It's just the concrete that's broken. It's at the corner. Is there someone I uh, should contact? Actually, or can, can I, maybe I can stop you for a second. I just okay. want to make sure that, um, it, is this a, the type of thing that we could discuss as, um, as uh, announcements or under discussion of the earth, the, does this have to be as a, a, a member of the public general comment, or is this have? Chair Grumbine, uh, it yeah. can be made an announcement. It's uh, it's we don't shouldn't have it at public comment. So, um, okay. Chair Commissioner Edmonds, if you don't mind just waiting and announcing it, and just okay. a reminder to the board members, she can announce it, but uh, please uh, don't have a discussion about it. Just announce it. Okay, gotcha. I will. Okay. All right, so is there any other member of the public wishing to comment at this time? Uh, no chair. Right. That, okay, so we'll close public comment and on to the approval on, on to item B, approval of the minutes of the Historic Landmarks Commission, April 15th, 2020. Well, he makes a motion so move. Uh, sorry, who is that? That first me That was Michael. Uh, please. Okay. Commissioner Drury, and then second, who, who seconded it? Lee. Commissioner Uli. Okay. Um, all right. So under under discussion, do we have um, any edits? Uh, this is Lindvik. I have uh, a comment or a question for the commission. I'm looking at page five of nine. Okay. And All right, one the, second, let's get to it. Mm -hmm. Hold on, let's let the, uh, yeah, there we go, okay. The, for the first item on the motion, item one, you find details including third floor door, third floor door window configuration, um, cornices and handrails and other elements. Is, I, I'm assuming that that is it clear enough that we asked the applicant 
to actually use cut-ups on the fringe door windows as opposed to a single pane? Um, as long as we all, as long as we all agree on that, that's what we said. That's what we said. He, his, his plan had single pane on the third floor doors and we asked that they be made cut-ups. Yeah, I, that's true. Yeah. We wanted, we wanted, uh, panel, um, lights, not a single. Right. Yeah. Right. You wanted, we wanted lights to match multi, the multi floor. light. To match the second floor, right? Yeah. Mr. You can include that as a clarification since that was part of the motion. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. I have another item, if I might. I'm on page seven. Okay. Wait, wait until we get there. I'm looking at that that item five motion. Views of the solar canopy structure from the street are a key problem. Um, views of the solar canopy structure from the street and surrounding properties, I believe, would be ha having our concerns in, you know, fully described. Mr. Chair? Well, I think, yeah, Commissioner Drury. Uh, I agree with Glenvik. It was also the view from uh, the tower of the courthouse and the Build all the buildings. Sorry, can you say that last part again, Commissioner Drury? Hang on. Yes. Um, so, we view not just from from the street, but from the tower of the courthouse and all the surrounding buildings that are tall enough. That thing. We found it completely um, um, not acceptable. So, I'm but part of, so. yeah, I, the, but part of our um, discussion on it was basically making it all go below site level, um, and I don't, and and I don't see how that could be a possibility if um, at all, just even if they were just flat on the roof, um, that uh, from the because from the courthouse you're going to see everything. Um, so I, I don't know if that it seems it, it seemed to be a concern that people had was what it looks like from the courthouse. Um, but at the same time, there was also a lot of discussion of and direction to try to just basically get them out of the view of uh, to, to drop them down below um, uh, and 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 which they could possibly even do without a without um, uh, depending on how they did it, but without uh, because they're solar panels. Mr. Chair. Without the, approval of us. Yes, Commissioner Lundvik? I think you're making it too complicated. We simply said that views of the solar canopy structure from the street and the surrounding elevated properties is a key, are, is a key problem. Yeah, I that, agree. That, make it simple. That's what we said. Whether or not you're in the Arlington Hotel or Arlington uh, building or in the museum's offices or wherever, I mean, the, the, all those are concerns of what we look at. I agree. So I would think that should be corrected to read uh, solar structure from the street and surrounding elevated properties are a key problem. Okay. Mr. Chair. And and uh, Commissioner Drury, you made the motion. Again, with, I think that needs to be put in there. Uh, they've already gotten their direction and there was a proposal for um, okay. The walking away, so on the yeah. Okay, I think that that's a fair add, a fair add to it, and, and especially because the commissioners that made the motion were also um, wa wanting that to be, and that did come across in discussion. So, okay, we can we can add that. Also, my last comment is on page nine, item in the motion, uh, item three at the top of the page, it looks to me like we've run two thoughts together there. The commission is generally supportive of a passenger drop-off proposal, period. And we're also talking about a, a California sycamore. That's a different item, right? 
Yeah, you're right. So this is, is sort of a, a, a banner day because with commission. Two thoughts there, and I would suggest to uh, the word proposal, put a period, and then another number and as an option for landscaping. Thank you. Yeah, for the, uh, yeah, I think that makes sense. Obviously, the uh, the encouragement of creating a passenger drop-off uh, uh, requires the removal of that sycamore, and I think that's really what what's being trying to get get at at this particular suggestion. We were supportive of the passenger drop-off, which results in the removal of the sycamore. Mr. Chair, yeah, Commissioner Huff, my recollection is that there is a tree to the left, there's a tree great to the right that's empty, and there's some other planting mm -hmm. mound in the middle that's not a sycamore. And it was Julio's suggestion that both of those tree planter greats have sycamores in them. And they're gonna remove the planting in the middle because it's a drop off. Mr. Chair? Yeah, Commissioner Drury? This is, this is true, I agree with Commissioner House. Um, well, let's let's maybe clarify a little bit more and say passenger drop off goes with the suggestion to look at California sycamore uh, as options for the planter grate. As as uh, options for the planter grate in front of the the building, so that at least location is is locked in. So I, I do think they're connected, but they are separate. Um, they were, yeah, they just need to be tied together yeah. a little better. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. Okay, any other edits? The second is okay. Commissioner Uli? The second is okay with the edits. All right, and Commissioner Drury? First is yeah, okay with the motion. Yeah, I am. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, so, any other? Yeah. I was going to say this is Heidi Rydell, and I can take a roll call vote if you are ready. Okay. And all right. Sounds good. I don't think there's any other any other edits. So. All, all right. right uh, vote. Chair Grumbine. Yes. Vice Chair House? Yes. Commissioner Drury? Yes. Commissioner Edmonds? Abstain. Commissioner Lundvik? Yes. Commissioner Mahan? Abstain. Commissioner Uli? Yes. Commissioner Vania? Yes. All right, that's everyone. Thank you. All right. So we have it unanimous with, well, not unanimous, but all in favor with Mayhem and Edmund abstaining. All right. So we're on to item C, announcements, requests by applicants for continuances and withdrawals, future agenda items and appeals. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I have a couple announcements, um, one in regards to this meeting. Uh, I will be the staff person moderating the meeting, but Will Russell, um, who all of you should have previously met uh, before we um, went into our closure due to COVID-19, um, he is going to be the new staff contact uh, for the Historic Landmarks Commission. So he is still in the training phase. Um, he is going to participate a little bit, though, in this meeting specifically uh, for items three and four on the agenda. Um, also, I just wanted to make a general announcement. Um, the city is putting together a handout for applicants regarding the remote public meeting process. Um, this should be coming out to applicants fairly shortly. Um, and what's really involved in this um, is kind of just telling applicants about the process 
um, as well as uh, suggestions for how they can be prepared for um, the remote meetings. Um, also some deadlines um, that staff will be enacting to ensure we have a smooth meeting process. Um, so one of, one of the elements that we have in this handout um, is that we will be doing test meetings prior to the full commission meeting um, for HLC. This will always be on the Tuesday prior to the full commission meeting at 2 p.m. Um, this is intended for applicants who um, have not yet participated in the go-to webinars to test out their microphones and webcams um, to make sure that they um, have troubleshooted these issues prior to the actual meeting taking place. Um, another one of the elements we've included in this handout um, is to require all plans and supplemental information to be submitted to staff um, in advance of the meeting. This is uh, for HLC the Wednesday in advance of the meeting. Um, and this was part of our process um, already. We require electronic plans to be submitted in advance of the meeting so that they can be uploaded online uh, for the public as well as for the commission to review in advance of the meeting. Um, so that's consistent with our current policies. Um, and then lastly, uh, just some um, general items as far as how to have a successful meeting process. Um, we've asked applicants um, to mute themselves and turn off their webcams if they're not speaking. Um, and also um, to remind them that while this is a new meeting process, we're still following the regular decorum. There is the applicant presentation portion, public comment, um, then the questions portion where the commissioners uh, may ask questions of the applicant and it makes sense for the applicant to have their webcam on and, um, you know, to uh, be able to answer your questions. So they'll have their microphones on as well. Um, but when we go into the um, deliberation portion of the meeting, um, so following questions when it's just the comment phase, um, we, uh, we are asking applicants to um, turn off their microphones and cameras um, because that portion of the meeting is really intended for the commissioners to deliberate um, and then make a motion uh, at that time. Um, so those are the pretty much the nuts and bolts of um, this uh, handout we will be sending out to applicants. Um, and one last item actually is uh, to encourage, um, you know, our remote preening remote meeting process to run smoothly. We are uh, requesting applicants uh, limit their presentations to about 10, 15 minutes. Um, this is so that they can get through their presentation um, while still allowing time for public comment and for the actual questions comment phase of the meeting um, without running over time. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and those right. are all my announcements. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Clark. Commissioner Lee? I would just make a request that uh, that handout that you the staff sends to the public, could they send it to the commissioners just so we know what it looks like, what it says, what it contains? Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks. Thank you, Chair right. Mr. Chair? Yeah. I would like to request that it be the usual course for each meeting that um, a link to the previous reviews plans be included. For instance, the uh, Waterfront Hotel we're reviewing today. Um, I think last time we saw it, there were the beautiful uh, rendered drawings and today it's all uh, computerized. So it's always handy to be able to review what it is we looked at last time, which we often do uh, in a meeting in the meeting room. So it would be nice if that could just as a matter of course be uh, a link included. Uh, Mr. Chair. That, okay, is that doable? Um, or, yeah, okay, so I'm, look, sorry, just one second. I'm 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 seeing staff nodding head yes, so I think that we'll be able to do that. Oh, yes, Mr. Chair, we, we can include that, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, great, thanks. All right, uh, Commissioner yeah. Lendick, do you have a? It, it, yes, uh, I I simply went to the, uh, the prior agenda for the hotel, which was October 9th or whatever, and, and uh, picked up all the drawings at that point. So they are available to us if, if we kind of just, you know, look back at what the prior meeting date was and you're able to pick them up right away. I know that. I'm just thinking that 
instead of every member having to find that for themselves, if the link was just on the HLC members page, that's a, a lot easier. I, I agree. Um, okay, so any other um, any other comments or questions on this item? Yep, uh, Ellen. Uh, yes, Chair Gombrand, thank you so much. Um, I want to just echo what Pilar said, and just uh, for new information, just to let you know, um, I'm here. I will be moderating the public comment portion, so I'll be helping out with that. Um, Heidi Rydell, the secretary, will be doing a roll call for all the votes. And then um, Timmy Bolton, associate planner in long range planning, is going to be controlling all the plans and supplemental materials. So if you wish to, Timmy, I don't know if you could just turn your webcam on really quick, please. Um, he, if you have any specific instructions of where you want to go, um, that's both to the applicants and, of course, to you, the commissioners. Um, he will be doing that. And just a reminder to the commission as well, um, if you are not speaking, please mute yourself and uh, turn your webcam off. And um, when you wish to speak, please turn your webcam on if you have one and, um, and wait for the chair to call on you to unmute yourself. Um, that will just help out. Um, and just know that if um, I might mute you, if we're picking up background noise, it's not to censor you. It's simply um, to, to make sure that, that there's good audio quality. So I, we will make sure that you're unmuted so you have the ability to speak if, if that uh, happens. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Edmonds. Um, I just want to announce that there was a significant accident um, at the intersection of Arbolado and APS to one of the altered rail walls. Okay. And, and basically if that can be looked into um, going, you know, going forward, if staff can look into that and give yeah. us some information, is that it? Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, I'm happy to look into that and um, to see what we can do about getting that repaired. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. I, Mr. I, Chair, Commissioner Dre. Yeah, I did, what slips my mind? Uh, could could we all make an effort um, from now to come online a little bit? Fecunda's um, there, and if we get on, if we can get our all of our one thirty, it would certainly speed the opening of the. Thank you. Yes, duly noted. Um, what, uh, one more thing I, I did want to ask about the commissioners is um, how, because now we've had one full time um, with this, is there any other um, issues or difficulties or other things that you want to request of staff or your thoughts on it um, currently, um, how, how the process is going in terms of digitally? So Ms. Mr. Chair, um, I'd actually suggest, because uh, I don't want to get into a discussion on, on that since that's not on our, on our agenda. Um, I would suggest if the commissioners have any kind of um, feedback on the remote meeting mm -hmm. process, any suggestions, they email me directly. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. All right. Okay, on to item D, subcommittee reports. Any subcommittee reports? No report from designations. Okay. No report from awards. All right, sounds good. Uh, and Commissioner Mahan, I don't know if you have the capability for um, webcam or camera, um, but uh, and it might not work this time as well. But um, if you do, if you if you do have a possibility for it, if you could turn your camera on too, that's just been from last time. That was the thing that was asked, so that everyone can see our beautiful faces. Mr. Chair, I don't have interruption. a interruption. Okay. I don't have a camera. Okay. Yet. All right. Well, we'll we'll wait until you do it to be able to see your beautiful face. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So, on, um, any other subcommittee reports or non-reports? All right. So, on to item one. Um, staff presentation. That's the discussion item staff presentation on the proposed amendment to the historic resources ordinance. 
So the historic, resource, historic landmarks commission will receive a presentation from staff summarizing the proposed amendments to the historic resources ordinance and related public review process. The public review draft of the proposed historic resources ordinance um, will be posted on the city's website on April 30th, 2020. Um, and there's an address and a subsequent public hearing to review and discuss the proposed historic visual or ordinance will be scheduled at a later date. All right. I see Nicole Hernandez. Yep. You'll take it Thank away. You. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Um, so I just want to, um, we are very excited to have a full draft ready to release for um, review. And I am joined today, who is also a panelist, um, Greg Lusitana, the assistant city attorney. And it was one of his very first assignments when he came on a board to get this draft created. And he and I have been working together to get a draft ready for the public in your review since November, I believe. And it, we've really, been hitting the ground. It's been a lot of work and there are some, a lot of changes and we really wanted to explain the changes before releasing it because it's not a red line version because we changed a lot of the formatting. And once you have that context, I think your review will be a lot more productive. So you'll, we'll answer a lot of questions and things to look out for as you read it. And so you can be aware of them so that when we come back for our a deeper discussion, you'll have a lot more background as to why we did those and why those are in here. And so that's why we wanted to just really introduce it first before releasing it. So next slide, let's get, go through all this. Timmy, next slide. Timmy, are you there? Oh, here, here we go. So. The purpose, um, as I said, it was to um, outline the ordinance changes prior to the review, as I just explained. And then we will have a subsequent public hearing where all the people in the community who want to talk and discuss submit comments and we will take them all in and you can give your comments and we will take all the suggestions and come back with a revised ordinance. We don't have the exact date. We know the public wanted at least four weeks to review it. It's a 44 page document and it's dense. So we hope to do it in like four to six weeks. It's just with the COVID, we weren't sure of the exact date because things are changing every day. And, but we are com we're coming back um, and we're, it's gonna just go away again. Um, next slide. So I think that there might be a minute. short lag, but. Okay. So um, just for background for some of the commissioners who are newer, in 2012, um, the city adopted the historic resources element and that did direct um, staff to protect historic resources by revising our ordinance. And one of the main um, elements that was in our existing ordinance that many of um, the community has wanted is to um, cross the criteria for designating historic districts and among some other things, but that's um, been one of the big sections that's missing. Next slide. Sorry, it's about the lag. <laughs> Might be a longer presentation than we thought. <laughs> They're gonna go pretty fast, but okay. So I just wanted to outline the objectives of amending the ordinance besides the um, historic districts. One is to update some terms and definitions to be consistent with the Secretary of Interior and the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, develop the criterion process to establish historic districts. We also did some streamlining of the designation process as well as the um, alteration and approval process to help um, it re be really smooth and clear for applicants as well as staff. Um, we increased the enforceability, um, improved the organization of the chapter, and we removed some redundancies that were in other chapters. Next slide. So 
for Nicole. This is part of my interruption. I think you're the only one who's, I think not as many people are experiencing the lag. So worst case scenario, you can turn your webcam off and that might save some of the bandwidth um, and then maybe oh. turn it back on. Um, okay. But yeah, we're yeah. seeing it pop up right away. Oh, sorry. I'm not seeing it. <laughs> okay, now yeah, here. I'll turn that off. Um, okay, so one of the biggest things you'll see is that we incorporated the Title 22, 22 into Title 30, which is the zoning ordinance. And the real benefit of putting it into the zoning ordinance is because of the litigation and enforcement. Um, it will allow zoning notice to result in a statute of limitations. And it will also allow um, the property rights that are encumbered are not only um, for designation by enactment of the zoning amendments. And um, we did revise the format consistent with the rest of Title 30. Next slide. Hmm. Can we click? Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, updating the language is to consider the national preservation standards. With Excuse me, this is. Nicole, I just wanted to point out the previous slide. Um, another reason why we're, we're moving it to Title 30, that is the zoning ordinance, and that um, allows the city to uh, enforce and impose penalties on people who may be violating um, portions of the historic preservation ordinance. So if someone, for example, uh, demolishes the, uh, uh, an historic resource, putting this amended amendment into Title 30 allows the city to uh, go after um, anybody and enforce, uh, including in position of civil penalties and so forth. We don't currently have that ability if we keep it simply in Title 22. So that's an important aspect. And as you'll see later in the draft, we have provisions for enforcement and penalties uh, proposed in these amendments. That's all I had to say. Thank you, Nicole. Sure. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay. So back to the next slide. And then we're, um, so, um, like I said, we did update some definitions to be consistent with the state and national, um, preservation standards. One of the biggest is we are pro proposed to rename the potential historic resources list to the historic resources inventory because everything on that potential list under the jurisdiction of the HLC and considered a historic resource for CEQA, we think relieve a lot of confusion for the public about what potential means and that it is considered a historic resource until it's removed off that list. We also defined urban historian title as architectural historian as that is how it's defined by the Secretary of Interior and includes um, qualifications for that um, role so that the public always knows the qualifications for the role that are of that person and that they meet those moving forward. Next slide. Sorry, I don't see it. Okay, so we also streamlined designation of listing processes. We eliminated um, the resolution of intention step, which I think the commissioners all know is kind of confusing when it comes to us to just set the date that we can't really talk about the project. Um, so we're just going to move to just getting it on your agenda so we can have public hearings. And we're gonna, we have proposed to authorize the or an architectural historian to list properties on the historic resources inventory um, administratively. Next slide. It's a lag. So, um, we added the criterion process for historic districts and we really clearly defined major and minor exterior alterations. So it's very clear to applicants and staff what kind of projects which would be major go to the board and what kind of projects are minor that um, the architectural historian could issue a certificate of appropriateness for that don't need to come. Um, some of our, we don't have that very clearly defined right now. And it tends to be a little bit of a gray area. Next slide. Um, we did remove the Dunlin Review Study Area to increase the protection to be citywide. Right now it's just in a mapped area. And this will also um, allow us to fulfill our obligations to CEQA where we do have to review everything over 50 years old. We also removed the survey section to include that as part of the process and 
historic resources and inventory. And we added the section on enforcement and penalties, which we'll, I'm gonna discuss all these a little bit deeper. Next slide. Um, so just to be clear, now we have four types of historic resources and the format of the ordinance um, outlines each in this order, landmarks, structures of merit, structures of historic resources inventory and historic districts, which are mostly that we would be reviewing or contributing resources to that district. Next slide. So under each resource, we have the same format. So when you go back and forth, it will be clear and consistent. And right now they all kind of change back and forth and it goes kind of cross. <laughs> so we wanted to, for ease and understanding, each resource has the following subtitles, procedure for designation, repair and maintenance of the property the property and exterior alterations, relocation and demolition and findings. So getting that um, consistent was a big, um, big project in itself. Next slide. Um, so the, we kept, we have the same criteria we have now. We just added that the property um, needs to express its historic integrity to be consistent with the um, state and national standards for landmark structures, merit and resources on the inventory. For historic districts, we included the same criteria for register historic districts so that we're consistent with those districts. That way, if a community or a district wants to apply for a national register district status, they already have the criteria um, to fill out that application and be consistent. Next slide. Um, designation authority, just um, we're going to outline really quickly who designates or the city council designates landmarks and historic districts upon the recommendation of the Historic Landmarks Commission. And the Historic Landmarks Commission designates structures and merit and architectural historian adds properties to the historic resources inventory. We have that um, because we have so many minor projects like a building coming in with a window alteration and they haven't, and I identify them as historic, it's difficult to have them wait two weeks to come in for a minor alteration when we can add them to the inventory so we know that they're eligible and make sure that they're under the right jurisdiction. Next slide. Uh, these are just um, some uh, flow charts just for the public to understand. So we have a landmark designation come in. It's nominated by a commissioner, the owner of public of who resides in the city. Then it comes to the HLC for a public hearing where they adopt a resolution to designate or not. And then it goes to city council for a vote on the final designation. Next slide. And then we have structures of merit where we have the nomination by the commission, owners of the public, if it's someone who resides in the city. And then it just is voted on at the HLC. Um, and they make the final decision, although that decision can be appealed to council. Next slide. So listing on historic resources inventory, this would be by nomination, a council member, an owner, a public, or as I review them when they're over 50 years old, when they come in an application for alterations, um, or as a result of a professional survey. If we have a professional survey and the HLC accepts those findings, we would add all the buildings that were found significant to inventory, similar to what we did several years ago with the Lower Riviera and the Bungalow Haven. Um, then we would have the administrative listing, which can be appealed to HLC, um, and we'd have, um, we'd bring the list to the HLC to nominate the property for further designation hearing or removal. Next slide. And then we have the historic district designation process. This would be the commission can nominate based on the result of professional survey that found a, a district, um, also neighborhood organizations or property owners, and really um, making sure that those all contributing on contributing structures when they come in. So we know what we're designating. And then, then the HLC would have the public hearing to vote on a recommendation to council. And then we'd finally end it at council um, after that. And maybe public PC. We're still looking at those process. Thank you. Next slide. Um, so I had said we really defined major alterations that would go to HLC. These are really um, big visual changes on the front elevation. I think 
I can keep thinking of the project where they wanted to remove the character defining chimney, the front elevation to the side, or add a dormer, or move windows around, or change their front porch, um, or large additions, um, 500 square feet or over, over one story, or visible from the public right away. We get a few tiny, small little bump outs from the rear that we don't think would really warrant coming all the way to the HLC if it, it matches. And then, of course, all relocations and demolition come to the HLC. And then minor options, next slide. Um, this would be some, some things that the architectural historian could issue a certificate appropriateness for. These would include in-kind replacements that match in size, profile, exposure, detail, relief, and dimension. These are things like windows, lots of windows that are deteriorated if they match the original or doors or repairs or siding, roofing, um, restoring project to its original condition. I think the most I see of these would be if somebody's enclosed their porch and they want to open it up again and all the evidence is there that it's going to go back to its original state or taking out aluminum slider and putting back in double hungs that match what they originally had or maybe color color changes that are appropriate to the style or meet our color guides. Next slide. Um, I, there is one thing that in new in the ordinance and appeal to council is that when um, they do appeal to council, evidence presented to council is limited to the record of proceedings considered by the commission. So not really bringing in a, a whole new um, presentation because it's um, not really what, what the commission heard. Um, it makes it a little confusing. Next slide. Oh, and then um, here's some things about the topic that we did with the historic districts. We call historic district definition now is similar to a landmark district, almost exactly the same. Landmark districts were the, were the term most commonly used when they first passed preservation ordinances in the 60s and 70s. And then the national um, Park Service changed to historic district. Um, so that's the most common term. So we're going to use historic district for most of the districts, but we will retain El Pueblo Viejo as a landmark district. That is the name of it in the charter, and we, we're not going to change the charter. Um, so we want to keep that, but everything else will be called historic district, including Brinkerhoff. That's our proposal. And every, like I said earlier, every district must clearly have contributing and non-contributing resources. So we know what which ones are historic that we need to protect and which ones might um, be newer is why they're not contributing or it's so altered it doesn't contribute. Slide. Oh, the demo review er study area, I did mention that we removed that section. That was a section of buildings that stat that I come and review that if they're um, to evaluate if they're over 50 years old, if they would qualify. We're now going to review that citywide. Anything over 50 years old, I'm going to look at when they come in um, to, to evaluate if they would qualify as historic resource. Um, this is our first filter. This is uh, important for our obligations to CEQA because CEQA does require that anything that could, is eligible as a historic resource be evaluated. So um, we changed that to citywide. So that's a really good measure. Next slide. And that's what we remember the survey section, most mostly because it is actually a goal and implementation of the general plan, and it's in the general plan, and and will become a priority of a work um, a workflow rather than an ordinance. And we will we did add that um, anything identified in a professional survey that the HLC has accepted will be added to the inventory or moved to designate. So we um, include that. Next slide. So here's um, the enforcement and penalties provisions. Um, back in 2017, Jaime Lamone, um, who was supervisor of the section at the time, did go to the council ordinance committee and um, talked to them about them. They did give really positive direction that they wanted these kind of enforcement and penalties included in the ordinance. So one, um, a misdemeanor, any person who violates the requirements of this chapter will be guilty of a misdemeanor. Um, we can also establish a moratorium. If someone demolishes a whole structure on a site without permits, we can put a moratorium for development um, for up to five years on that site. 
And I know that's typical in, um, up and down the coast of California and other communities. Next slide. Oh, civil penalties. So we can enforce with civil penalties equal to one half the fair market value of the property if it's demolished prior to the demolition and alteration equal to one half the cost of the restoration of the altered portion of the historic resource. Next slide. Um, and remedy is the, the city can also um, pursue other remedies um, in addition to not in lieu of the ones that already enacted. And next slide, I think we're almost done. Oh, and um, continuing violation will each day be considered a new violation. So it would be like $250 a day for each and every offense. Next slide, if there's any more. Oh, next step. So today, April 29th was our introduction of what we've done and worked on and um, given you some frameworks. So when you go read it, things to look out for and the document will be available tomorrow. We really wanted you and the public and everybody to be able to see it at the same time and anybody who wants to look at it be able to see it. So it's it's posted at Santa Barbara CA.gov HROA amendments, HRO amendments. Um and we're gonna have at least four weeks. The public um has told me over and over they do their biggest concern is we didn't have enough time to review it. And so with COVID, we hope to have it back in four to six weeks. Um, and we will have subsequent meetings. We will um, you know, bring it back, talk about all everybody's concerns and suggestions, have the committee commission make um, motions of what they'd want changed. And we will um, work on that and get it back to you after that. So um, we're not, uh, so this is just our kickoff. We can take questions and now, but we don't need any action at the commission at this time um or it's just the intro and then look forward to your reactions and thoughts thank you thank you all right i see commissioner uli um well i guess uh but first we, we should probably um probably want to do open public comment yeah so, okay so we'll start now um the presentation finished we'll start with public comment any member of the public wishing to comment, please look at the, um, the how to here and raise your hand and we can go, um, we can work through any public wishing to comment on this. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. So I have uh, Mr. Richard Clausen. Um, you will have two minutes to speak. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. Now you have the opportunity to unmute yourself and when you're ready, go ahead and speak, please. Thank you very much. You can hear me now. Yes. Loud and clear. Uh, uh, this will be brief. It's just a question for the um, historian, um, uh, Ms. Hernandez. You've noted that there's going to be a four week public comment process. Um, will the document uh, tell us specifically um, what that process is? I can foresee that um, many of us may have initial comments that we'd like to make and we'll probably email those, but uh, then later groups of us will meet together and, and uh, re review things will there can you make uh, additional submissions of comments um just how do you foresee that month-long period of public comment going and will be, will there be any interim um, point where the uh, submitted comments are made public for the rest of us to chew on and comment that's it thanks all right thank you mr Clausen. and mr all right Chair all the um, attendees who have um, raised their hand and I'll hand it back over to you, please. Sorry, what was the first part you said? Oh, forgive me. Um, I was just saying that we don't have anyone else in the audience who um, wishes to speak, but oh, uh, we all may have received written comment. Yeah. So okay, Mr. Great, Chair, great. Uh, you should have received um, a written correspondence from Anna Marie Gott um, which was submitted on Friday, April 24th. It would have been sent to the commission all in advance of the meeting. Um, so I'll just ask that you acknowledge uh, that public comment. Thank you. Yes, and we received, yes, we were, did receive that letter. Do we, is that, is that, that, that's, that's good enough for that, right? 
So, okay. Um, any other public comments before we close public comment? Not at this okay, time. Okay, so we'll close. All right, we'll close public comment and on to the commission for questions. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Drury. Uh, Mike, Michael Drury. Um, yeah, um, Mr. Hernandez, is the certificate of appropriateness, is that part of the language of uh, historic resource findings? Uh, thank Mr. you, Mr. Hernandez. Chair. Um, um, Mr. Drury, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. That is the national, that's a national term for um, the certificate of appropriateness is what all well, the I, okay. community do. So when you get approval for some a minor change and an administrative approval, you can have a, you'll get issued certificate of appropriateness that you can post if people are working, wondering why you're doing it, or you can take to the building counter that you have, you, it's, it's your administrative. And yes, it's the national term through the Secretary of Interior in the state office. Well, I, I've wanted one, one of those all my life, so I guess I'm. <laughs> well, maybe you can do a, a, an application for something and you get a certificate appropriate and put on your wall. You can apply. All right, Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner. Uh, I thought uh, Commissioner Uli had been up before Commissioner Lendick to see, see if he had. Um, Commissioner Uli, did you still have something to discuss or ask questions? Uh, uh, just a general comment and a question. First, I realize uh, the, the tremendous amount of work that it goes into putting to codifying something. Um, it's really the lawyer's realm of word uh, it makes it complicated sometimes for the common man to know know what the hell's going on. Uh, so uh, there's my comment. So I'd like to uh, thank staff for the work. Um, with respect to historic districts, um, this has always been kind of a fuzzy thing for some. And that is um, in this rewrite uh, in chapter 31157, uh, with respect to historic districts, is there a percentage of contributing resources that is the threshold to make it a district? Uh, and uh, if not, why not? And for those non-contributing resources that are within the district, uh, is there some relief should those properties um, come forward with a project uh, that doesn't subject them to the somewhat burdensome requirements of being in a district. All right, um, Ms. Hernandez. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Uli. Um, to begin with, yes, we would like uh, there to be a threshold of percentage of contributing structures within a district. Uh, we have put, we want a percentage. We think council will be the final decider on that percentage, but we can talk about it. I know that the proposed, we have six districts right now that um, were proposed. They were they were discovered in professional surveys and they're all on the potential. Um, Ms. All of them Ms. are- Ms. Hernandez, sorry. Can you, could you repeat that? I, you were breaking out at least on my end. You're breaking, cutting oh, out the last- Oh, sorry. So frustrating. Um, so you were saying there are currently six six districts. Yes. Yeah, so we have six districts. All of them have over eighty percent contributing resources, and I think nationally most districts attempt to be over eighty percent. You want it to have high integrity, um, so that it feels like a historic district and it has this integrity on the streetscape. Um, I've researched up in California and other communities um, when I was researching writing this, and it goes up and down throughout the state from 60 to percent to over 80. Um, but we do want to establish a, a solid or in the final draft. And your other question, um, non-contributing resources, do they're not subject to obviously the, any of the historic resources um, the in Secretary of Interior, they would be under the jurisdiction of the HLC, mostly so the HLC can ensure they um, compatible with the rest of the district. Sort of 
similar to how the El Pueblo Viejo is today. You know, you review new construction in the district um, for compatibility with the rest of the historic buildings in the district. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, as a follow-up, I know uh, Limbic is stacked up here, but just as a follow-up to that, uh, beg your pardon, yes, Limbic. Um, so what percentage are you proposing in this draft? There must be a number in there that you're proposing, and what is that number? So we actually left it blank. We put blank percentage, but my <laughs> personal my personal recommendation is 80%. I, I feel comfortable with 80% when I would put forward something to you, but it's also um, maybe something you all can, we can talk further about. I mean, it's, it might be a community decision, but. I would, I would that, agree that, uh, I would agree that it should be um, a majority, uh, at least 75% of the buildings in a proposed historic district should be contributing to the district. Otherwise, what's the point? I, I agree. All right, Commissioner Lindvik. Yes, Ed Lindvik here. Uh, I was, I, I had a question very similar to uh, Robert Uli's. Uh, but, you know, he talks about percentages. I wonder, in the EPV, could you even claim that 50% of the buildings in EPV are contributing now? Uh, I'd have to think about it. I'm not sure that they would. Right. And, and one other comment, that, or my main comment was, uh, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, you needed to have uh, well, Commissioner Lembeck, I think you cut out or you're you're sounded. Uh, I, I think I think that the um, the comment that was made in the presentations Com Commissioner Lembeck, you're still cutting out. Um, Take it from the top. Question, um, Chair Grumbine, this is Ellen Kokenda. Um, I think everyone else is hearing uh, Commissioner Lenvik oh. okay. I think it's on your end that there's a lag. Oh, okay. So you, you may want to um, log back out and come back in as one option. Uh, I'll continue and then get off quickly. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that you had to identify contributing and non-contributing structures or, uh, you know, uh, parcels or, or landscaping or whatever um, to give the district its, uh, its validity, I believe. And I'm wondering, ha has that been done or is that intended to be done in EPV? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Limick. I actually um, did a lot of research on EPV for this. Um, I know we have about, we have 106 properties on the potentials list in EPV and about 200, I think over 200 on structures of merit and um, landmarks in EPV. Um, so, but I still think that's only about a, less than half of EPV. But I also think a lot of EPV hasn't been identified um, for example, our, the structure merit we're going to be designating on the next item wasn't found on the potentials list or, or designated until this um, application came forward. So I do think EPV needs to be um, resurveyed for historic resources to be contributing and non-contributing. Um, so I think we need to go retroactively in that one and figure it out. <laughs> and it might be something we included um, as a process and a guideline, uh, more of a process rather than in the ordinance. But I, I believe me, I think about that a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is it, is it, yeah, go ahead, Commissioner Lundick. Is, is it possible that EV, EPV's original intent, which was, hey, this is the core, the original portion of the city, and we wanna preserve its, uh, what we have there, but we also want to uh, perpetuate and encourage development that respects that. We may not fit under state and national guidelines for EPV, but it's important that we look at the district historically um, and understand where we want to go as opposed to where we've been. Yes, sure. yes, that is possible. Okay, Commissioner Uli. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I would suspect if we counted up uh, the actual parcels within that district and then uh, determined uh, what the age of the improvement was on that building, that greater than 75% are over 50 years old. Um, and if that's really the threshold in which to define a historic district, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with that. Um, further analysis needs to be done as to what the value of those 50 year old buildings are with respect to the historic district. Um, I also suspect that the dist uh, this particular district we're talking about has a very funny gerrymandering uh, fingers off here and fingers off there, uh, primarily for the city to have some control over what's going on within the properties within those outlying fingers. So um, my sense is, and I wasn't around when the line was drawn, my sense is it's, um, it's arbitrary. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. Yes, thanks. Commissioner Howe. I would just suggest that maybe that's another good reason to refer to EPV as a landmark district, uh, which distinguishes it from the other historic districts. So it doesn't have to uh, fit the same rules as historic districts. Yes, that's a good point. Thank you. I would, yeah, so I have, I've had lots of thoughts of how to deal with um, them. We could, you know, have a list of contributors that um, contribute, but we do need to reevaluate lots of the district. And I do believe there's about 1,100, almost 1,200 parcels in EPV. Um, and one and two just, put just together. To uh, as a added follow-up to some of those questions, um, so can you uh, talk a little bit more? Because we haven't had we haven't had the contributing we haven't had the, really the district discussion um, because we haven't had the rules to play by really yet. But can you talk about the difference between uh, a contributing member to a district versus a, a you know designated historic resource? So we you know sort of in our discussions of leaving things on the potentials list versus on mm -hmm. uh, designating them historic resources versus a landmark, there's kind of different thresholds for different things. And can you talk a little bit more about what, what a contributing member does that might be, how that might be different or how, where, where is that bar set compared to um, a, a, the bar of the historic resource designated nation? Yes. So, um, typically in a historic district, um, and I've worked with lots of historic districts in my um, other cities. So the district is considered the main resources, resource and all the contributings are historic buildings that give that significance. So the Bungalow Haven, for example, has 80% of 120 buildings. All are bungalows and are the, the pieces that make that district important. If you start to lose them one by one, you lose the whole. And um, so it's important to keep each little piece like we would a window of a building to keep the whole. Whereas when you have an individually designated building like a structure or merit or landmark, they can hold their own. Lots of contributors can hold their own as well, but the individual one doesn't need everything around it to and it's all by itself. So that's typically where we capture outside of a district, like um, a school, a church, or a really significant building that may not have neighbors all around it that um, really warrant a full district, um, but it still is important in its own right. And um, so I've worked with in the past have 800 buildings, um, huge neighborhoods that are still intact. Um, so it's a it's a really efficient way to capture a lot of buildings and protect a really intact area without going in one by one. So, you know, I said there's 106 buildings in EPV on the potentials list. It would it would be great to have all of those become contributors in a way somehow or put our head around how to resurvey so we don't have to come in one by one with a separate hearing for each building in EPV that's significant, which is a lot of buildings. And the efficiency of a district is really to protect them all in one hearing. Um, so that way we can, and Great. they all can Thank be you. Protected. All right. 
Um, do we have uh, other questions? I think Commissioner Uli, you were up before I cut you off. Um, oh, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I forgot what I was going to say, so it must not have been all that. <laughs> Sorry, I cut it. it was a while ago. <laughs> well, okay. okay, any Can other questions? Well, pour lots of coffee and happy reading. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers to that. Um, Okay, so um, and I, I guess this was all questions, but if uh, any commissioners want any want to throw in any comments as well, um, we're still um, on time, so we can, um, or a little even a little ahead of time. So let's we, we can. Um, uh, why doesn't everyone everyone who would like to add some comments to this, um, commissioners? Oh, and I see Renee Brook. All Hi. right, Julie. Hi, thank you for letting me jump in just towards the end here. Um, Nicole did a great job presenting this. And like she said, we're so excited to finally be able to release this to the public. Um, she had put up their uh, website where the document will be posted tomorrow. Also, we have a web page on um, the Planning Central website uh, specifically for this work effort. And on that is an email address where people can send comments. So I just wanted to make sure people know that not only can you get the document on that, thank you, on that website, um, but there'll be ongoing information, updates about future meetings and how to provide comments. So I just want to make sure people knew that too. Thank you for letting me interject. Great, no problem. Okay. So, um, any, any commissioners, do you have any, any comments on what you've seen so far? Obviously, this is just the beginning, but any, anyone wanted to add comments to what they're seeing? Commissioner Uli? Uh, uh, for the record, I didn't remember what I was going to ask before I came up with a new one. Um, All right. <laughs> good. Uh, uh, first of all, I agree with this provision of allowing some level of administrative, um, I don't know, designation, I think, is probably too strong of a word. but. Um, you know, if a building uh, hits a threshold of 50 years, um, there should be some level of staff review that determines whether or not it's important. Um, uh, so uh, can the staff kind of highlight just a little bit more how they see that working? You know, I'm an applicant, I come in with a remodel to my, you know, house on Garden Street and, and it's uh, 51 years old. Um, undesignated, not on anybody's list. I care about it deeply, but nobody else does. Um, so can staff kind of uh, lay out how, how they see that process work? Yeah, so, you know, this is something I do every day right now. I, come, I get called down to the counter. We have something over 50 years old. We come look at it. Um, you know, your house happens to be Oh my gosh, I just looked it up. It's designed by Luda Maria Riggs. Your house actually might qualify even though you're only 51 years old, you know? So I um, really need to tag this. I know you're only applying to regroup and it's matching existing. So we can approve that on an administrative level, but I need to identify it so that if you come in for anything else but that might be more major, we make sure we evaluate it properly. So that right now, the only thing I do is I tag it in our um, system, say this may be eligible as a historic resource because we have to schedule a hearing now for you as a commission to add it to the potentials list. So they have to have a hearing to be added to the potentials list and then another hearing to be added, to be designated. And they have to wait two weeks at least to get on an agenda to have a hearing to have just be added to the list when they really just wanted a reroute. So allowing me to add it to the list so staff knows what that means. They're like, oh, they're on that inventory. Don't give them the permit until you go to the architect historian and see if it needs further review by the board. We're trying to find a way to streamline this so especially so we can get them identified um, without causing major delays in our um, permitting, especially when they're really minor projects. 
Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Mr. Right. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Mahan. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, suggest that, that uh, all historic resources aren't equal. And um, I think when we look at, a, at like El Pueblo Viejo, we need to recognize that the Arlington, the courthouse, uh, some other buildings are very, very special. And then there are resources that, that, that are, are helpful, but they're not necessarily as important. We need to, uh, you know, when we're looking at, at, uh, at, a, at the Historic Landmarks Commission, I mean, at the, uh, at the El Pueblo Viejo, we need to recognize that, that uh, some of the buildings are, are more important than others in terms of their, of their historic resource, as a historic resource. I would agree with that. Yeah, I, I would as well. And um, uh, Ms. Hernandez, if you could, uh, uh, as in, it's my understanding that that's sort of how things are not necessarily graded, but it's sort of set up where landmarks are at the top historic resources are next, um, and then um, contributing to a historic um, uh, district, and then sort of lease would be, or maybe maybe I'm mis mixing up the two, but um, but then just uh, what was that? What was that new designation we we have? We have uh, inventory being just being put place. put on the inventory as being sort of the lowest rung. And it right. needs to go, go up higher and higher. And with a, a more review process, the higher it goes. Yeah. Um, and I think, yes. And I think we, we do sort of, that's when we elevate things. We tell, tell, the commission usually directs me, this building qualifies as a landmark and should be moved up. And you should, we'd ask staff to prepare the landmark designation or, or I bring it to you, you know, like this is, you know, a, really important film by George and Smith and it's sitting on the potential flip <laughs> or you know the new inventory but now it's not potential yeah now it's an inventory yeah 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 which I think is okay. clearer um, but we would like to you know we the goal is to get them designated as you know, so they have their public hearing. if they if they rise to that mm -hmm. um I, mr chair okay. i would mr. Early? I would add to Commissioner Mahan's uh, characterization and amplify the landmarking. Um, you know, there's city landmark, state landmark, national landmark. And so as you go up, continue to go up the chain, um, that state and national landmarks uh, should hold a higher importance to maybe a city landmark that's sitting next to it or down the street or somewhere. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just to, to give it that extra level of care. Mr. Chair. Yes, Commissioner Mahan. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and I think we also need to consider the, the size. When you're, when you say, like you say, 75% uh, or 80% of the building should be contributing. I think we have to consider the size. A small resource can't be as important as the courthouse or the Arlington Theater, which, which are, you know, they're very big and they're very important. Um, uh, a, a small, th there's a little building um, across the street from the Paradise Cafe, um, a little adobe that's, uh, that I think is a uh, landmark. And, and it's, it's important, but it's very small. So it can't have the same uh, clout as the courthouse or, or, the, or the, bigger, the, bigger, uh, the bigger landmarks, in my estimation. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, okay, any other when you, comments? When you, read, oh, yeah. when you read the definition of landmark um, review, you're not, it's, you know, you can decide if you think it needs to be strengthened or the findings for landmarks are currently and will be, are they stronger? We still won't allow demolition of a landmark, um, but um, in alterations, the, land, the findings are strong. But um, this is your time to look at those and decide if they're strong enough, or, or you know, you know. I suggest you read that section carefully, and um, because the format's consistent through the three, you could actually just put the three find, you know, through each resource, the findings for each side by side, and see the differences fairly clearly. 
and decide if um, that's how you want them each to read. Maybe we can have a landmark bronze, silver, gold, platinum. That, that was a good joke for the record. Mr. Chair, maybe maybe we should have a, maybe you should we should have stars stars like they do with movies or like they do with yeah, uh, with general mutual mutual yeah. mutual funds a two star a three star a four star a five star the courthouse would be a five star the mission would be a five star and uh, there we go and everyone that walks by has to bow right <laughs> um, okay Genuflect. Genuflect. well genuflect. Then you fight. There we go. <laughs> Only if it's church, though. Um, all right. So, uh, any additional comments? Now we're we're um, yeah. Obviously, we're going to be getting into this a lot over the next couple months. That's my guess. Um, so, um, yeah. Unless there's any other uh, any other comments, we, we can move on. Um, I would I would add to all the other comments that uh, our thanks to the staff. Uh, um, uh, well, all, all the staff um, for that have been working on this hard for so many years, and um, it's very exciting that it's um, coming forward now. So, all right. So, and we don't need a motion or anything. So, I think that is it for now. Is there anything else we need to do, um, Ms. Plummer? No, Mr. Chair, um, you're able to move on to the next item. There's no motion because this was just a discussion item. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. With that, I will um, close this item and on to item two, uh, miscellaneous action item for 524 State Street. This is a, a, review, a review of a staff report and public hearing to consider a structure of merit designation of the Mediterranean style building reconstructed by noted architect Sewell Murphy Hastings in 1925. All right. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and commissioners. We just have a brief presentation um, to outline the criteria for which this building qualifies. And next slide. Um, as you mentioned, the building is um, was constructed in 1925, or actually reconstructed in 1925. Um, by Sewell Murphy in Hastings just after the earthquake in the Mediterranean style. Um, next slide. Um, the building um, qualifies under Criterion A um, as being important to the heritage of the city. Um, as you know, right before the earthquake, the city was planning this Mediterranean Spanish colonial revival style um, look for State Street. This was George Washington Smith. Um, drawing for State Street. And right after the earthquake, they um, started designing it because of the opportunity. And Sewell Murphy and Hastings designed a building that fits right into these drawings um, in the Mediterranean style. And that it contributes as a key um, to Santa Barbara's identity um, and is really important on State Street. Next slide. And this is one of those buildings I wanted to just reiterate that until now was not on the potential list or identified as historic. So there's some holes in EPD, I think, that need to be identified. So on, on uh, this um, is an exemplification of the Mediterranean style um, being very symmetrical um, with the side gable roof. It has um, the arched windows over the square um, storefront. It still actually even retains the beautiful divided light transoms over the storefront and the iron balconies and the um, horizontally divided lights and the fan lamp over the front door, all character defining features of the Mediterranean style. Next slide. And um, it also is uh, the design of Sewell, Murphy and Hastings, um, very prominent architects in Santa Barbara that um, really helped define the city in Spanish colonial revival and Mediterranean styles. They did many, many buildings throughout the city. Um, and we owe a lot of what our city looks like to their the talents that they brought to the city. Next slide. Um, and the building also qualifies um, for its embodiment as without standing attention to design details, materials, and craftsmanship. It does have the rectangular um, symmetrical form on the front elevation with the terracotta tiles over the low pitch um, front 
um, gable and wrought iron balconies on the second floor with delicate brackets. It even has some really unique um, molding underneath the eave, as well as the whitewashed stucco walls and the horizontally divided lights of the doors and windows on the second floor. And it also, next slide, has a high historic integrity. Um, it really does retain almost all its original materials on the front elevation that, so that it can convey its original appearance with location design, setting materials, feeling and association. And I recommend you um, adopt a resolution to designate the building a structure of merit. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Um, all right, thank you very much. So with that, I will open public comment. So any member of the public wishing to comment, you can follow these instructions, raise your hand, and you would like to comment on this item. So, Mr. Chair, I don't see anyone who has uh, raised their hand currently. Um, and so I don't, I'll ask Pilar if um, anyone submitted written comment. Mr. Thanks. Chair, there's no written correspondences for this item. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, so if there's no public comment, I will close public comment and I will go to the board for, or to the commission for questions. Commissioner Uli. I don't have a question. I'm ready to make a motion. Okay, do I have any questions? All right, I'll Commissioner Uli. Wait, hold uh, on. He hasn't even said what it is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Commissioner Uli. <laughs> um, yeah, Mr. Chair, Commission, uh, I'd make a motion to adopt resolution 2020 33. Uh, thereby designating as a structure of merit in the city of Santa Barbara, 524 State Street, uh, APN number 0371730396. Second. Oh, and I'll, I'll, I'll let Commissioner Edmonds get a shot at this one because she had. Yeah, second. Uh, had <laughs> Sorry. All right. <laughs> All right. Commissioner Edmonds, second. All right. Under discussion. Any discussion? Mr. Chair. Mr. Drury. Mr. Chair, Michael Drury. Um, yes. Yeah, this building, I, I when we looked at it a couple of weeks ago, reminded me that it's one of those, the prime examples of what isn't there. And I think it seems to me, I may be wrong, you, you all are the architect, but one of the secrets of, of that um, style is opens open wall space. And this has it in spades. And I, I thought they did a very sensitive job on, on their presentation two weeks ago. And I, I think the more I see these photographs, uh, that it's such an involvement of, dare I say it, poetry. I'm, uh, I, I, the stuff that we have been seeing that have been presented to us and we see around the city seems rather crammed in by comparison. And I'm, I'm really pleased that this building is being designated. Thank you. All right, thank you. And I will pass it on to Bill Murphy and Hastings that you like their design. And Mr. Chair, we need to do <laughs> roll call on that motion. So Ms. Rydell. All right, sounds good. Yes. Okay. Hi, this is Heidi Rydell. I'll be uh, conducting the roll call vote. Chair Grumbine? Yes. Vice Chair House? Yes. Commissioner Drury? Yes. Commissioner Edmonds? Yes. Commissioner Lenvik? Yes. Commissioner Mahan? Yes. Commissioner Uli? Yes. Commissioner Vania? Commissioner Vania? I think you might be muted. Commissioner Vanier, are you able to unmute yourself and let us know your vote? If not, we'll, I suppose we can mark it as an abstention. Okay. All right, um, I guess Pilar, for, to, for the purpose of moving the meeting along, should I 
mark uh, Commissioner Vena as abstaining from this vote. Hey, yes, Ms. Raydell, if you could do that. Thank you. All right, the All vote right. is unanimous with one abstention. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And now we are. Um, okay, we're on to item. Oh, uh, and uh, this, uh, I guess that that um, motion is not um, um, appealable. Is that right? Um, Mr. Chair, that last item is an appealable item because it is a designation. Okay. Uh, so if you could announce oh, the gotcha. appeal period, thank you. Okay, yeah. So sorry, 10, sorry, 10 day appeal period to city council. All right. Thank you. Um, okay, so now um, we are on to item number three, the archaeology report for 726 East Coda Street. So this is a proposal to construct 466 square foot uh, garage and storage space for the primary dwelling and a new ADU above. This is a request of one interior setback modification for new construction. And this, and so the report is requesting acceptance of a phase one archeological resources report prepared by Brent Leftwich. Okay, so do we have the applicant here? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is Will Russell, staff. Um, staff just had some brief comments for this archeological re resource report. Um, uh, it was reviewed by our environmental review liaison, Dr. Glassow. Um, he agreed with the conclusions and recommendations of the report. HOC will not receive this project or review this project. Um, so I will leave that uh, for the commission to um, discuss uh, the conditions and uh, recommendations made in the report. So I'll leave it to the commission. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Um, so, so, uh, so I'm take, I take it the, the applicant's not here to, to give a, a quick little summary. Yeah, so Mr. Chair, um, it doesn't appear that the applicant is present, at least I don't see him listed. Um, and just as a reminder, I, oh, I, I see Sarah Bronstad actually, she is one of the applicants. Um, Ellen, would you be able to elevate Sarah Bronstad? If she's there, I believe I see her hand raised. Um, but in any case, these reports are uh, confidential. So um, until, and then I this see is, Brent left, which is hand raised. He popped up. Thank you. Yeah, this is Katie Bolton. Ellen had an internet connection issue. So I elevated Sarah and I will make um, Brent, a panelist as well, which will give both of them the ability to unmute themselves and turn on the webcams. Thank you. Great. Sorry. I think I just was Thank able you. to lock back in. Sorry about that interruption. All right. All right. Welcome. Thank you. So would you like to um, give us a, just a brief overview of what your findings were? And Sure. Um, so, uh, did the uh, the phase one survey I believe back in February? Uh, the house was turned on the property. It was actually not built on site, but transported there uh, from another location in 1929. Prior to that, according to all of the uh, the Sanborn fire insurance maps, it was just an empty lot. Um, there is nothing else that has any historic on it. Uh, the a lot of the property was covered in hardscape or buildings, but the actual area where they're planning to put this ADU did have good visibility. Um, there used to be a garage that sat on that property according to the Sanborn. I don't know when it was torn down. It was not in the city records, uh, but uh, visibility was good there and there was no artifacts or cultural resources seen prehistoric or historic that would cause any concern. All right, thank you. All right, so if you're done with your um, with the summary report, I will um, open public comment. So anyone from the public wishing to uh, address the commission on the on the archaeology report itself, um, 
please raise your hand uh, as shown on the, on the instructions here. Mr. Chair, um, I do not see anyone who's raised their hand. Um, so I'll ask Pilar if there's any written uh, correspondence. Thank you. Mr. Chair, we didn't receive any written correspondence on this item. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so with that, I'll close public comment and bring it back to the commission for questions on the report. Mr. Uli? I don't have any questions. I'm prepared to make a motion. Okay, any, anyone else with any questions? All right, with that, I'll, Commissioner Uli? Um, yes. Would you like to make um, a motion? I'd like to make a motion to accept the report. I find it that it provides adequate enough information for the commission to take action in the future. Second by House. Oh. All right, second by House. Okay, under discussion, any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Uh, Mr. Chair. Oh, roll call, sorry, roll call. <laughs> I wouldn't use the autopilot, sorry. <laughs> Pay no attention to that. <laughs> Mr. Chair, this is uh, Heidi Rydell. I will conduct the roll call vote. Uh, Chair okay. Grumbine? Uh, yes. Vice Chair House? Yes. Commissioner Drury? Yes. Commissioner Edmonds? Yes. Commissioner Lundvik? Yes. Commissioner Mahan? Commissioner Uli? Yes. Commissioner Vania? It looks like uh, Commissioner Vania is still self muted. Uh, Commissioner Vania, are you able to unmute yourself and give us your vote? Looks like he's trying. I see the light go on and off. Commissioner Vania? Yes. Oh, I, I hear you now. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That vote is unanimous. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. So that is item three. So now we're on to item four. Okay. So this is an archaeology report for 635 East Gutierrez. Um, this is a, a put the project is a proposal to construct a new one story, approximately 9,000 square foot energy storage facility on a 14,700 square foot lot at the corner of East Gutierrez and North Quarantina. Um, which, which is a good name for this meeting right now. So, uh, a loading and turnaround area is proposed, but no vehicular parking spaces are proposed. Grading quantities include six cubic yards cut in 1,000 cubic yard fill. The project includes the demolition of approximately 6,900 square feet of existing structures and its requested discretionary approvals include a development plan and conditional use permit from the Planning Commission. All right, so this is requesting for acceptance of the phase one archaeology report prepared by Heather McDaniel McDevitt from Judah. All right. Mr. Chair. So welcome. Yes. Uh, quick yes. staff comments. Uh, similar to the mm -hmm. last archaeological report, um, this will not be reviewed by HLC. This will be reviewed by the ABR. Um, this was also reviewed by the environmental liaison, Dr. Glassow and he agreed with the conclusions and recommendations made in the report. So with that, I'll return it back to the over to the HLC. Thank you. All Mr. right, Chair. thank you. All right, so if you would introduce yourself and give a little summary of your report. Um, my name is Heather McDaniel McDevitt. I'm the senior archeologist with DUDEC here in Santa Barbara. And um, we conducted a, a pedestrian survey and background research. Uh, according to the city's San, uh, master environmental agreement. And um, the uh, background research showed that we have um, features on the area uh, somewhere between 1907 and 1930. Um, and so it has been developed at least since 1930. And um, the area uh, project area was completely obscured by um, hardscape and and uh, structures, and um, so although we did not find any historic or prehistoric 
um, resources, we found that the, the survey was not reliable because we could not see, um, there was no barren ground or anything to uh, observe. So our recommendations, um, oh, also the um, archeological record search shows that so far there has not been anything uh, identified in the area for prehistoric. Um, there are two buildings that are within the quarter mile radius, but not on the project site, um, two historic uh, resources. One is a building and the other one is a transmission line, um, but neither uh, intercept or are, are on the uh, project site. Our recommendations are that uh, once demolition has um, occurred, that a survey will be conducted um, to at least be able to observe the, the barren ground. Um, if it is determined that there's fill soils on top um, of native soils, then some preliminary subsurface testing will, will um, should be conducted in order to identify whether or not there are cultural resources in the native soils. If there are, then that should be elevated to an extended phase one to determine and then to go on from there based on what is found. Great, thank you. Does that conclude your presentation? Yep. Right. Okay, great. All right, well, so with that, I'll close, or sorry, I'll open public comment. Um, any member of the public wishing to comment on this item, on the archeology span report, um, please follow the instructions here, raise your hand, and you will, you will be called on, pulled in. Mr. Chair, um, I do not see anyone who has raised their hand for this particular item. And again, I'll pass it to Pilar for written comment if there's any. Mr. Chair, there's no written correspondence on this item. Great, thank you. All right, so with that, I will close public comment and back to the commission for questions. Any questions from the commission on the archaeology um, report? Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Drury. My, Michael Drury, yeah. Uh, Ms. McDade, is that uh, property, would that be somewhere near the marshland that uh, occupied that whole bottom of Santa Barbara? No, it is outside of the prehistoric watercourses sensitivity zone. So the, the two sensitivity zones that it is a part of is the American period and early 20th century. I'm, I'm confirming that, hold on to make sure. Um, it was within the American period and early 20th century sensitivity zones. It is outside of that marsh area. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions? Okay. All right. In that case, uh, uh, comments and or a motion. Mr. Uli? Oh, you're muted. You're, I think you're muted, Commissioner Uli. You saw my lips moving, but you didn't hear any words. Or that <laughs> That's right. That means we need to learn how to read lips. Um, uh, I don't have any particular comments. I think the report uh, is adequate uh, and identifies uh, what it needs to enlighten the decision makers for. I'm ready to make a motion when you are ready. All right. Well, I think you, that you can go for, go for that because there wasn't any other questions. So might as well jump into a motion. Make a motion to accept the phase one archaeological resources report. Uh, 4635 East Gatera Street slash 411 North Cor Quarantina Street, Santa Barbara, California, APN number 03129312. I second that motion. Second by Edmund. Under discussion, any discussion? They're quick. All right. Yeah, they are. You got to be faster, Commissioner Dury. In real life, it's different. <laughs> they got to be faster to click. And then All Ms. Right. Rydell, can you conduct the roll call? Yes, this is Heidi Rydell. I will conduct the roll call vote. Chair Grumbine? Aye. Vice Chair House? Yes. Commissioner Drury? Aye. Commissioner Edmonds? Yes. Commissioner Lundvik? Commissioner yes. Lundvik? Yes. All right. Gotcha. Uh, Commissioner Mahan? Uh, 
Are you muted? Mr. Mahan, are you still with us? Yeah. Yes. Oh, there we go. Uh, Commissioner Uli? Aye. And Commissioner Vigna? Yes. All right, the vote is unanimous. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay. So, with that, we will close that item. Um, let's see, we're at 315. Are we a little bit ahead of schedule? Maybe we should take a little break. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, we are allowed to start within 15 minutes of an item starting, but if you'd like to take a short recess for five minutes or 10 minutes, we can do that. Yeah, let's yeah, do that. Let's take a, I, I think last time I was brutal and I, it was like one five minute break over like six hours. So that was, <laughs> um, yeah, why, why don't we do a, a 10 minute um, recess and then we'll, we'll gather back at 325. I have a question. Um, if I close yes, my sure. laptop, Am I going to lose you and I need to log back in or should I, can I just leave it open? I don't know how that works. I, um, Ms. Edmonds, I would just leave it open. Um, it'll automatically mute everything um, when we go on our recess. And, Thank you. And, and it will automatically close off our webcams as well. <laughs> Yes. If I may just uh, interject, um, go ahead and just get used to get in the habit of turning off your webcams and muting yourself. But if someone's forgotten to do so, I'm going to make sure that everybody's muted and all of their webcams are off. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank we'll you. see you at 325.
Okay, so item number five, uh, 111 West Valerio Street, project design approval and final approval. So the American Clean Revival style residence constructed in 1894 by Samuel Disley is the designated structure of merit proposal to address violations listed um, as an enforcement case by permitting an existing unpermitted six foot high privacy fence. The fence will remain in the existing location along the property line frontage of Chapal Street and will be relocated four feet back from the property line frontage at the corner of Chapal Street and West Valerio Street. The project includes landscape improvements to the front entry of the residence at the front facade of the existing fence and at the parkway planters located at the right of the right of way on Chapal Street and West Valerio Street. The project includes 135 square foot of deck extension to the existing deck located at the east side of the residence. And um, a minor zoning exception is requested to allow for the six foot high fence to be located within the first 10 feet of the front line. This is for project design approval and final approval are requested. A minor zoning exception is requested to allow for the six foot high fence to be located within the first 10 feet of the front lot line. Neighborhood preservation ordinance findings and structure of merit findings are required. The project was last reviewed on the consent calendar and referred to the full commission on April 15, 2020. All right. Mr. Chair, um, this, and Mr. Chair, this is really, I assume by the reading of that matter, the commission has reconvened its hearing. Oh, yes. Sorry. That was the, the first part. So the, the uh, we are reconvened. Thank you. Sorry. And then Mr. Chair, um, I have some staff comments as well as Ms. Hernandez before we uh, proceed with the rest of the presentation. All right, sounds good. Why don't we go into those and then we'll go into the presentation. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Bolton, can you actually go to the findings section um, towards the end of the PowerPoint? So not in the memo. It'll just be on the regular PowerPoint. Okay, um, so as it says in the footer, um, this project was previously reviewed on the consent calendar um, and was continued uh, to the full commission um, from April 15th to today. Um, we'll have you go through the minutes uh, from that consent meeting, um, but I just wanted to give some general background about what's included um, in uh, a decision if uh, the commission decides to take an appeal of decision at this hearing, uh, what's involved with that. Um, so the project uh, before you does include a minor zoning exception request. Um, what this uh, what this has to do with um, is that the project involves a um, request for a fence to be uh, to remain at six feet in height along the front property line. 
Um, our ordinance uh, requires that fences within the front um, setback um, and within 10 feet of the front lot line shall not exceed 42 inches. Um, however, our ordinance also allows you to request a minor zoning exception for additional fence height. Um, so while the standard is for 42 inches, you can receive additional uh, fence height um, under a minor zoning exception. And there are findings uh, for a minor zoning exception listed in our ordinance and it's towards the end of our PowerPoint. Timmy, if you can go towards the findings section. Should be several slides. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to read these to you. Um, so you bear these in mind while you're reviewing the project before you today. Um, so minor zoning exceptions can only be approved um, with an A and a B um, that the finding um, that such an exception will not be detrimental to the use and enjoyment of other properties in the neighborhood and B um, that the improvements are cited such that they minimize impacts to abutting properties. Next slide. And the project generally complies with applicable privacy, landscaping, noise, lighting standards, and the single family design board guidelines. The improvement will be compatible to the existing development and character of the neighborhood. And lastly, um, that the finding uh, shall not create or exacerbate an obstruction of the necessary sight lines for the safe operation of motor vehicles. Um, this last one, I just wanted to confirm uh, during our completeness review on this project, we did uh, have transportation staff review um, the proposal and they did indicate that as designed, it does not uh, create or exacerbate um, an obstruction of necessary sight lines. Uh, so that was part of our completeness review. Uh, but the rest of the minor zoning exception findings um, are findings that the board will need to consider. And if you do take a decision at this hearing, um, you'll need to include your reasonings for why you are granting a minor zoning exception. Um, in addition, this property, while the fence is not a structure of merit, the property does contain a structure of merit. Um, that is the building and uh, Ms. Hernandez will probably go into that a little bit more uh, in her staff comments. Um, it also includes uh, finding for neighborhood preservation ordinance findings and that, uh, to me, next slide. I think it's the next slide. Um, so those are all listed there, uh, consisting of appearance, compatibility, quality, architectural materials. Next slide. And um, health, safety, workflow, good guidelines and public views. Uh, so I just want the commission to consider these findings while you're, you're reviewing the proposal today. Um, and, you know, just uh, bear in mind any comments you might have, um, we'll, need to, we'll need to go back to these findings um, if you decide to take a decision today. Thank you. Great, thank you. And uh, Ms. Hernandez? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just made a quick PowerPoint outlining the um, memo that I sent to you just for the public. Do you have that PowerPoint, um, Mr. Bolton? Hi, Ms. Hernandez, I don't have that PowerPoint. I do have the staff memo though, if we wanna run through it that way, if that works. Um, otherwise- sure. it Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Um, so I just prepared a memo just um, to you an idea of the condition of the property installation because it was installed you see it before or you might not have in the context of the neighborhood and guidelines that i found for historic context um in the secretary of interior's guidelines in our draft guidelines that were adopted commission in 2015 like option we go with our ordinance so, Mr. Hernandez, um, I, mean, yes. I don't know if anyone else is experiencing it, but um, I think it might be the same situation with your camera on that the bandwidth gets stretched a little bit. Um, so I might try that. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. I just, it was the building itself was built in 1894 in the shingled vernacular style of the American colonial revival style. And it was designated a structure of merit in 1989. Um, really, I added these images of the streetscape just so you could see the character of the neighborhood. Um, you can see it originally, or not originally, but before um, the new fence, it had a picket fence with a hedge behind it. And across Chapala, there you see there's a low stone wall. And then if you cross over on, on the next page, there's um, you can see the building at 1703 
um, has, it used to have picket fence under construction with a new hedge is permitted to be put in that was approved by this board. And then finally, a caddy corner across the corner is another structure, is a potential building with a picket fence and a stone wall. So just to provide you the historic context of the streetscape, um, there are a lot of historic resources in the neighborhood. I used our new um, map that shows all the structures of merit in orange and the potentials in blue and the landmarks in purple to show you how many buildings have been identified. And there are more that are unidentified in that area um, that give it really a late 19th, early 20th century um, integrity. And I did find um, the Secretary of Interior does address setting in their gu guidelines adopted in 2017. And they did say they don't recommend um, introducing a building or landscape feature that is visually or otherwise incompatible with the setting of the historic character of the building. Um, and they did give the example of a low, like you had a low metal fence probably a wrought iron fence, they wouldn't recommend it um, to be replaced with a high wooden fence. And our own um, draft lines um, say match new fences and walls in material height and design with those that appear historically in the neighborhood and the architecture of the home. So just wanted to do that um, background resource, uh, research and have that available for you all as a reference as you continue your review. Thank you. And then, uh, Mr. Chair, lastly, um, I would ask that you read the consent minutes from April 15th, um, and then we can proceed with the rest of the presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. So do we have um, the consent minutes? Um, I, I have them separately here at the PDF um, for on my screen, but... Um, Mr. Chair, they, I believe right. that's oh, there on it is. screen. Okay. Gotcha. Okay, there's just not a highlighted ones. Okay, got it. Okay, so it was um, so it was for project design approval and final approval. Oh, wait, that's, we already read that. Um, so to continue, the, the motion was to continue indefinitely to the full commission with the comments that the Chapala Street frontage is not acceptable as currently designed. Uh, a site visit is suggested in order to understand the impacts of the existing oak tree, the as-built fence on the Chapala frontage, and and to consider the historic character of the neighborhood and surrounding streetscape. In general, the consent reviewers found the additional parts of the landscape plan and Valerio Street frontage more acceptable, but are continuing the project to the full commission for consideration. Um, and that was uh, reviewed by myself and by Commissioner Vena. Um, and so with that, I'll now turn it over to the applicant for presentation. Thank you, Chair of Grumbine. This All is right. Trish Allen with Suzanne Illich, Planning and Permitting. Can you hear me okay? Yep, great, okay. loud and clear. Robert, do you want to introduce yourself? Okay, uh, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. uh, yep. It's audio, great. yeah. So Robert Adams, Landscape Architect uh, for this right. project. Yep, thank you. Um, thank you. So, um, being as this was reviewed two weeks ago at the consent calendar, um, I, I believe I have to go, you know, not have to, but I'll go back over the, the project and just briefly give uh, the commission the, the site orientation. So, Mr. Grumbine, I'm going to just make some brief introductory comments and walk through the, the photos. I have a couple other images that I asked staff to put up. I apologize for the late request. Um, yeah, great. And then uh, after I'm done, I, I will have Robert walk through, uh, walk through the plans. He did um, supplement the plans with some images so that you can really get a better look at that oak tree. And I'm, I'm hoping some of you were able to get out at the site as well. And then uh, uh, the property owners are, I think they're listening in. I don't see their webcams on. I'm not sure if they will be able to um, uh, have the technology to, to join visually. Uh, and so I do, I, one of the owners, uh, Rafael Almezago, will be 
will be speaking and making some concluding comments. So I just want to let you know we will go as through the information as quickly as we can. So here we've got the site uh, and, photos. We've got the, yes. And actually, if I can cut in for a minute, um, just because of the nature of the of this beast. Um, so if uh, typically we we have the um, applicant owner as part of the um, as part of the um, the presentation process, and I don't know. I mean, it's a question for staff. Is it a thing to easily enough done as part of when they're com complete their official presentation? If we can have the owner speak, or should is it easier to be to be done during a public comment section? Uh, Mr. Chair, I think uh, either is appropriate. Um, I think if they want to participate during the applicant presentation, uh, once the majority of the presentation is done, if they have some summary comments, I think that's fine. Um, they can also do it as public comment. Either is either is appropriate. And so, if if they wanted to speak during the presentation time, is, do they have a, a way of raising their hand or or letting a staff know so that they can get brought into the conversation? Uh, yes, we're we're aware of it, um, so we can we can look to have them included. Okay, Thank great. You. Well, yes, we'll do that. We'll, at, at the end, we'll, we'll of your presentation, we'll give it that opportunity. Okay, and I, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm just going to say that the owner is on, does not have webcam capabilities, but as soon as you're finished with your presentation, I'll unmute them, and then they'll be able to speak. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, All right, take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, so on the screen is an aerial with the property outlined at the corner of Valerio and Chapala. Next slide, please. Um, next slide. Um, here is the uh, the primary frontage, the, the front door uh, you can see here of the, the residence on West Valerio Street. Next slide. Closer view of the front. Next slide. And this is a, a closer image of the, the fence along Valerio Street. Again, Robert will walk you through uh, the proposed change on, on that frontage. Next slide, please. And this is, um, gosh, this is also, this is a view looking the other direction towards the west on Valerio Street. Next slide, please. And a closer up of the corner. Next slide. And this is a view looking down Chapala Street. Um, not easy to see the oak, well, you can kind of see the oak tree in the background there. Um, so looking south, if you reference south. Next slide, please. And the same Chapala frontage looking up, up uh, north, uh, up Chapala Street in the adjacent property there. Next slide. Next slide, please. Now, this is an image that was, uh, it was taken prior to uh, with the shingle repair in progress and uh, prior to the paint color change. So I just, we wanted to show you what that looked like before. Um, so those have been approved and, and permitted. Next slide, please. An interior shot looking towards the corner with the, the palm tree and then the, the oak tree limbs um, in, in the foreground there. Next slide. And that's the oak tree there again. The images and the plans that Robert will be walking you through um, are uh, better lighting. Next slide. And actually, these are just uh, neighborhood photos. These were shown in the in the staff memo also. Uh, Mr. Bolton, I think you're manning the, the photos. Would you mind putting up um, one of the photos that I sent you today? The one of the two. That's exactly right. That's the perfect one. Now, um, Ms. Hernandez did have the Google Street uh, photo uh, in her in her memo, I also took that same shot and wanted um, just wanted a larger image for the commission to see the previous condition with the white picket and the hedge uh, the hedge behind. I think in this image, I'm not sure if you can can you zoom in a little bit, um, Mr. Bolton. So you're seeing the the oak tree there, the gap. Um, thank you. Where the the hedge isn't growing up quite a few gaps in the hedge and the picket fence. And I think really what I wanted to show from this larger vantage point is 
that you don't have a whole lot of visibility to, to the residents uh, and um, behind all the, the vegetation there. Uh, next photo should be from the corner. Yes, thank you. Now this was taken um, just across, diagonally across the street with the um, Cheshire cat in, uh, right, right behind. And you know this is the, this is the fence in its existing condition. Obviously, this is before what what Robert's going to walk you through with proposing uh, relocation of a portion of that fence and some uh, planting improvements that that we've incorporated into the drawing. But I think it was an important view with the existing condition that you do. The public has a great view of of this resource, and really the focal point being on the Valerio Street frontage. Robert will get into a little bit more detail there. Um, and th this is an example, thank you, uh, Mr. Bolton, for anticipating where, where I was going. I, I'm not quite ready to talk about that, but that's okay for you to, to leave that up on the screen or whichever, that's fine too. Um, again, um, we're here, you know, for the for the minor zoning exception. Staff went through all the, the details about that. Um, really, our, our focal point is on the Valerio Street frontage, and and really um, the goals of, you know, enhancing that look. Really um, thinking about what what can soften that fence and and still provide the public with a really excellent excellent view of of the resource. And one thing that I've been thinking about since two weeks ago when we reviewed this, that's really unique to this property. Um, several things are unique. One, the placement of the house and where it sits on the property, it, what it, what, based on that placement, the, the usable open yard wraps around the building. And we have a lot, the owners have a lot of usable open space in that area along Chapala Street. So uh, Mr. Omezaga is gonna get, get on and, and talk about that a little bit more. But I think that that's relevant. There's a lot of uh, competing forces here. This is a single family residence, different than some of the examples shown in the neighborhood that have low walls, low picket fences. They, they function differently. They're commercial properties and they don't have a family living there with, you know, pets and children. So we'll get into that a little bit more. I think um, at this point, um, uh, I'm just going to skip this image and go in the interest of time, go ahead and turn it over to Robert to walk you through the plans and, and talk about the added images from last time. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Um, <clears throat> This, this is the cover sheet and what we have on here is uh, really the scope of work. Uh, we have the enforcement letter on the left of this drawing, vicinity map on the right, project data on the far right, and then scope of work really is uh, uh, mainly, uh, you know, the fence and the proposed landscaping, both in front of Valerio along the existing fence and uh, parkway treatment that's been neglected along Chapala. We want to do something great with that and while preserving that oak tree on Chapala. And then the, <clears throat> we're also um, looking at just extending the backyard deck into a side door. Uh, we're cleaning that up. Uh, that was staff suggestion and something we want to do. And then really uh, landscaping of putting a uh, a, a really excellent covering vine along that fence on Chapala. Can we go to sheet L1, the next sheet? Okay, so here's the plan view. Uh, we have uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, low plants in the parkway along um, Valerio Street, and then we frame the front entry with some uh, ornamental uh, trees, and we have some uh, really tough, drought tolerant, beautiful, low maintenance landscaping in front. And here on Valerio, we moved that fence from the existing conditions back uh, four feet. 
from where it is now. And we provide a, a hedge to surround an existing uh, green palm. Uh, here's the parkway. We're going to uh, uh, just really create a lower parkway right now. It has medium height uh, rosemary. And we're going to use uh, a, a lower ground cover. So it just really frames and celebrates the front of the house and really enhances the historic property. And then as we go around uh, Chapala, we have the existing green fence uh, that we want to put, put vines across in a really dense way and uh, really hide that fence, green that fence. We're gonna take the neglected parkway and use uh, uh, mostly ground covers and some accents and really clean that up. Right here is a big street tree, which has cast shade on this oak tree right inside the Chapala fence. And it's caused that oak tree really to grow um, uh, low branching um, over to the interior of the lot. So uh, this street tree caused a type of growth pattern on this oak tree. And we want to really uh, save and celebrate this oak for many reasons. It's a native oak, coast live oak, Quercus agrifolia, provides habitat and also a terrific screen from the backyard um, looking toward the street. So we have vines, fence, oak tree, and then the yard in here. Um, can we zoom out a little bit on this plan? Thank you. So here are some uh, images of uh, the existing front as it is now. Then over here on the right, we have the existing fence. And then um, we have a, 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 a mock-up of uh, the vine that we chose to really cover this fence. So we could we zoom into these two photos right here? That's it. So, so um, this should be a, a, a trumpet vine with uh, uh, that flowers a little, grows very dense, does great in shade, and it's it would really cover this fence. So that's the point here. Okay, so let's go to the next sheet. Okay, so here are uh, photos of the plant material on the top part of the plan that we're proposing. Uh, down here on the lower left is showing uh, the deck that we wanna connect to the side door, that condition. And then um, we're looking at the oak tree uh, inside the lot. We have more of those on another sheet. Let's go to the next sheet. Okay, here we have uh, an existing fence detail we have a deck detail, some planting details, and a photo of the existing fence, which is painted green. Okay, let's go to the next sheet. Uh, this is an irrigation plan with all the um, expected uh, uh, type of irrigation using drip systems, saving water. Anyway, irrigation plan, let's go to the next sheet. These are irrigation details and a water calculation showing we're not using very much water. Go to the next sheet. Okay, so this is really uh, a study of the existing oak. Now, um, we suggested that uh, uh, commission members um, go out and look at this situation, but we also did it in photographs. So here is that interior oak looking toward Chapala. And then this photo right to the left is really showing how low those branches are, what a wonderful oak it is, and uh, just what a specimen it is. The pictures down lower really show how that oak tree has grown uh, very close to the fence. We don't want to damage the oak in any, any way. We want to celebrate it. Um, and this, this fence over the years uh, really likes its conditions. You can see underneath the oaks is just oak leaf litter mulch. This oak tree is so happy there. It 
provides a, a very much a character defining aspect to this to the backyard and as well as uh, to the street as well. Uh, but especially in the backyard, uh, you can see how low the branches are. Let's go down a little bit lower on the plan, please. So I just have some notes, uh, existing condition notes about the character general statements about the observations I've made about this oak tree. Um, large native oak, it's, uh, it's a specimen. It's a long chapala. It has very low branching. It's very healthy, even though it's affected by the shade tree on chapala. And the trunk is extremely close to the fence. It's this where the fence was put there to really celebrate the oak and to create privacy. And it is a character defining tree. And that's all I have on the plans. So hopefully if uh, commissioners didn't get out there, they can get an idea of how close this oak tree has grown to the sidewalk and uh, why that existing fence was placed where it was on Chapala. That's all I have. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, at this time, if the, um, if the owner wants to say some additional words, let's see if they're... Um, Chair Grumbine, I've unmuted the owner if they wish to speak. Okay. Was there anything additional that you wanted to add to it, um, the owner? I, sorry, Chair, okay. Ellen Kokenda, I don't hear anything from them and I haven't received any messages. Um, so Monica, okay. Rubel, if you're there. Mr. Chair, I'm trying to um, help with the technology and get, get their attention to speak. Sure. They say that the call is still unmuted on, I guess, the city side. Um, pardon me, this is Ellen Kokind again. I have unmuted them and the microphone is green at this point. So they should be able to, uh, they need to unmute themselves at this point. They just muted themselves. Thank you for your patience while we figure this out. No problem. Okay, um, again, this is Ellen Kokenda. It looks like um, they must have logged out and then um, they need to enter an audio PIN number. So I, I don't know how long it's gonna take them to do that. Um, okay. And I don't really wanna hold up. Um, I just sent them sure. the audio well, they could call in, but um, you might wanna maybe um, Perhaps go to public comment. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'd yeah. suggest we go to public comment, and then once we're done with public comment, then um, we, we can see if they're able to back participate into. at that point. Yeah, before questions. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, perfect. And then, um, Ms. Right. Allen, did you have any additional items for your presentation, or were you done with your presentation? Oh, thank you. I'm I'm all done. I'm just trying to. Well, um, get them actually, I just I just want to add talking to the owners that they, uh, in their backyard, uh, they really uh, want need, want and need privacy from the street. Um, I know that's very important to them. They have a family, they have dogs, they wanna entertain. Chapala is a very busy street. So uh, that that is why they wanted a, a better screen than anything low or a hedge that was patchy. So. I just wanted to state that thank on you. the record. All right, thank you. Okay, and so if there's not anything else, we'll go to public comment now. Um, so any member of the public wishing to comment on this item, please see the instructions on the screen, raise your hand, and so that you can put on mic. Okay. Mr. Chair, um, I've got um, Mr. Richard Clawson, uh, who's raised his hand. So. Um, I know Mr. Clausen sent in a photo that he would like the board to see or the commission to see. Um, so Mr. Bolton will be pulling that up. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you, Mr. Clausen, and then you have two minutes to speak. Um, thank you, Mr. Bolton. Can uh, you display the first page of my document? Uh, 
Thank you. The upper photo was taken this week and is essentially the same as shown in the enforcement letter from October of last year, referenced on page one of the applicant's drawings. The lower photo is from Google Street View, dated February of last year, before the current owner bought the property last August. Next, I'd like you to look at page two of my document. Um, these are the neighboring properties to 111 West Valerio. Image three shows three structures diagonal on the potentials list, which now we know is gonna be the historic resources inventory and the new historic resources ordinance. They're all fronted by a white picket fence. Image four shows 114 West Valerio across the street and it has no fence. Image five is taken from Google Street View again from last year and the structure is currently under um, renovation and has been readdressed at 100 West Valerio. You approved, uh, the board, the commission approved the, the renovation to replace the picket fence with a hedge. And image six shows the structure of merit directly across Chapala Street. Um, can you, we look at the next page, please? Um, images six and, or seven and eight uh, taken this week show adjacent properties with picket fences. And below them is just a vicinity map to show that these images are immediate neighbors. They're not cherry picked throughout the neighborhood. They are very close in immediate neighbors to the subject property. Now, if you just please return to page one of the document, I think the gold standard for uh, a minor zoning exemption is this. If the applicant came to you when the fence looked like image two and requested approval for the fence in image one, I doubt that you would approve it. You are now presented with a fait accompli where the applicant is requesting forgiveness for a non-compliant fence constructed without your permission or a permit. And I urge you not to grant the minor zoning exemption and require the applicant to return the perimeter to its pre-fence clearance or appearance. There are many parts of the neighborhood compatibility standards that are not met. And you can't green up a six foot fence by covering it with trumpet vine. It's still a six foot fence. That's the two minutes is up. I'm sorry, we couldn't do the image and the um, and your timing. So I, I'll give it back to the chair to. All right, great, thank you. Um, all right, so do we have any other um, public comment? So those are all the hands that I saw um, and um, I'll give it to Pilar for written. Pilar, you're muted. Oh, Pilar, we can't hear you, sorry. Yeah. Apologies. Um, we only received one written correspondence and it was from Mr. Clausen. And since he just gave his public comment, uh, I don't think we need to go through that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we'll close public comment and bring okay. it back to, yes, Ms. Allen, is there a, um, do we have any more news on the, on the owner <laughs> side of things? I have all kinds of communications happening uh, here. So it looks okay. like from Ellen. Uh, Actually, uh, okay. So this is Ellen Kokenda. I think we're getting some strange feedback. If um, the property owner just muted themselves, um, it looks like they were able to join, um, but we need them to um either turn their tv down or turn their computer down if they're using their audio if they're calling in by phone because we're getting a lot of reverb so if they could if um if monica robles uh, or rafael whoever is the owner could unmute themselves at this actually um again my apologies it looks like they had it and then we lost them again they must have um dialed out or or stopped the phone call so i don't know they haven't entered their audio pin yet so i i'm not sure it we might still be interrupting the meeting well why, why don't we see let's take a minute or two to see if we can get get them back on because i do think it's important that they they are given a chance to speak here Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Commissioner House? While we're waiting. Were you, you going to sing a song or do no, entertainment? No, I haven't. 
<laughs> uh, I was just going to say that I believe there was another public comment, which is how I first learned of it when looked at the site. I think it was from a neighbor. I think it was Ashley Brilliant. Did we not receive that in an email? Ms. Mr. Chair and then to Commissioner House, um, the public comment previously received from Ashley uh, was read into the record um, at the consent meeting on April 15th. Okay. They did not resubmit new public comments. So we read that comment as the record specific for that date. Thank you. Okay, thank you. But I will comment that it's interesting that the two Irish members of uh, the contingent of the Historic Landmarks Commission are the only two that don't have cameras, which is unfortunate because <laughs> they look at the uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Probably the Commissioner Jerry. Uh, I was waiting for somebody to notice. The reason is we're part of a secret society and uh, Commissioner Mahan and I, and uh, we prefer to remain secret. That's, that's, the, that's the, the in and out of it. Thank you. I, I was assuming you guys were together at, at, at you know one of one of your private bars and just you know and just, <laughs> and just didn't want us to know. Yeah. All right, we were I, I've seen this plumber. Now we're at an undisclosed location. Mr. Mr. Chair, um, it since uh, Ms. Robles still isn't able to participate, I'd suggest to keep the meeting going. We proceed with questions, and if she's able to participate yeah. before the comment. Um, portion of the meeting, um, then we can do that. Um, but at this time, I think we should proceed with the meeting. Thank you. Sounds good. All right. Okay. So I see Commissioner Uli up. So do you have questions, Commissioner Uli? Um, could uh, staff give us um, just a brief, you know, couple of words about how long this violation has been in the process? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and then to Commissioner Uli, if you'll just bear with me for a moment. Um, it is a 2019 enforcement case. Any um, luck hearing me? Oh, hello? I hear someone. We hear hello. someone. Yeah. Oh, perfect. All right. Is this Mr. Uh, this is Robles? Rafael Amazagia. I'm one of the owners there at 111 West Valerium. I'm sorry, we just had more difficulty than we ever imagined. <laughs> no problem. All right. Well, why don't we'll we'll switch back to you for as uh, part of the presentation. And uh, thank you so much for your for your patience. Right um, no problem. You know, the we want to thank everybody for all their time and all their input. And wow, this has really gotten out of our wheelhouse to say the least. Um, we did just purchase the property in in August, and the fence came about unfortunately because not just did we have a lot of a lot of trash and when i mean trash i mean like liquor bottles and beer bottles um that were strewn along the chapala side we unfortunately had a couple people sleeping there come the early morning hours and the first time we figured well we're living in downtown santa barbara this is this is was bound to happen but the second time was really a, a cause for alarm and we were considerably worried um, between Monica and myself, we have six kids and I, I know that sounds crazy. Um, and five of them are, are 14 or, and younger. And that's totally crazy, by the way. <laughs> yes. And of the, of the, oh, six, I'm sorry, I, I have a big family as well. So, and most people knew that. So sorry. It was, it was a joke that was to, to no you, one here. I hear everyone's needed. All right, go right ahead. Well, it, it is crazy. Um, and we've got of the girls, there's of the kids there's five or six girls and just a little guy the youngest my youngest son he, he's 10 going on 11. but at any rate um the the second time we woke up and had somebody sleeping there right unfortunately next to that oak tree and right on the other side of that white picket fence where it seems like you know they just would hop over and and just go to sleep and i can't blame them but you know it, it's not just myself and it's not just Monica that we're worried about, we're worried about our kids, we're worried about our safety and we're worried about our our kids' safety. Um, and not, and besides that also our, our privacy. Um, so it was kind of a, a knee-jerk reaction just to, to put up the fence along the property line, hoping that, well, we can, we, we got to protect ourselves and we got to keep these folks, you know, outside of the, the bounds of the property. 
um, the before the fence went up, you could see quite clearly into the living room from Chapala and even from Valerio Street as, as you're coming down. Um, so it was a it was more than anything just a way to to keep the world out. Now I know um, Mr. Hernandez went to great pains to take pictures of the of the property surrounding us, and the, it, it is a beautiful neighborhood, which is which is why we we jumped in and figured we'd try to make the place a wonderful home for for our family. But the property she mentions and and she illuminates in the pictures are commercial properties. The Cheshire Cat, which is a beautiful bed and breakfast, makes up you know at least three if not four different parcels there in the area but but it's a commercial property it's a bed and breakfast that's been running for the last 30 years and and of course they want to be seen of, of course they want to show what a what a welcome and, and inviting business they have our neighbors to the north at um i believe it's 1703 chapala street who are also doing major reconstruction their their plans are to have that property as a as a wedding venue you know where, where people are going to come from around the country if not around the world to get married in santa barbara um and so we we're just a big family we're looking for some privacy and and some security in our in our quaint little place in santa barbara now the the oak tree you know is such a centerpiece and really we're hoping to make it such the focal point of the rear garden and the, the thought of anything happening to the tree is going to be a big bummer but i mean i don't see how we move back the fence without damaging the tree at least on that side the the issues that we're seeking or the the fixes are not are not detrimental to the neighborhood it's a fence that you know we're, we're not finished doing and we we want to make more more beautiful just as we have the entire property we've spent a lot of our hard savings in bringing that home um into much better condition as, as some of the pictures show you know with not just residing and repainting um but we're also going to have to do you know more repairs to the exterior and, and just to to keep it up but what i also wanted to, to relay is you know or reiterate is we're not finished and I, I think we can still do a lot more and we're hopeful that as Ms. Allen and Mr. Adams have, have pointed out the the entire front of the house that's there on on Valerio Street is a is a little different it almost reminds reminds me of being in New York on the Brooklyn stoops because your front door is right how on the sidewalk uh, we've got maybe you know two or three feet of of space and steps that lead us down onto Valeria when all of a sudden pal there you are so we don't have virtually anything as far as a front yard goes but I, I think with the plan that they have laid out of pushing back the fence on the Valerio site and really illuminating the the home and the small the small garden area there I think that's going to be really key to the area. The the height of the fence isn't as isn't as important as I I would say the the surrounding areas. The surrounding areas I I think can withstand the fence as I think transportation voted in to say it's it's not going to be an, an issue there. Um, in any event, I wanted to thank you guys so much for all your time. Um, Hopefully we can get through this process and, and with a little bit of luck, we can we can continue on and, and really make our home shine a little better. All right, thank you. Um, all right, Ms. Ms. Plummer, was there anything else that we needed to? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I was just gonna proceed with answering Commissioner Woolley's comment okay. um, or question. Great, thank you. So um, the enforcement letter is from October 15th of 2019, um, where the enforcement officer uh, was responding uh, to a request for investigation, uh, went out to the property 
um, and verified that a fence had been constructed um, without uh, HLC approval in the prior permitting um, in, the, uh, in the permitting necessary. Um, so it's been around since October of last year. All right, uh, follow-up question if I may, Mr. Chair. Yeah, please. Um, could you kind of walk us through uh, the regulations that place requirements on the height of fences and hedges at property lines, uh, realizing this is a corner lot, so there's a front line and there's a side line. Uh, could you kind of take us through uh, yeah. those? Yeah, so Mr. Chair, and then to Commissioner Uli, um, our fence and hedge section in Title 30 um, discusses height limitations, um, depending on where you're located in the property. It specifies uh, fences within required front and interior setbacks um, are limited at eight feet, except fences closer than 10 feet of a front lot line shall not exceed a height of 42 inches. Um, this property is a little bit unique because it has it has essentially two front lot lines and that it um, and that it faces both Chapala and Valerio Street. Um, so those for our purposes are considered fronts and uh, they're subject to um, that standard of being limited at 42 inches. Um, and as I said in my uh, comments earlier in the meeting, um, our ordinance in Title 30 does allow um, additional fence heights to be requested via a minor zoning exception. Um, and what that allows you to do is uh, for fences within front and interior setbacks, uh, request an additional four feet. So six feet is, is allowed um, via a minor zoning exception. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, okay, um, any other questions? from the commissioners? Yes, one more follow-up. Um, uh, when was uh, that portion of Chapter 30 adopted? Uh, Mr. Chair and then to Commissioner Uli, Title 30 has been in effect since I believe January of 2017. I believe that was uh, that was when it went into effect. All right, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Edmonds. Questions? Took my glasses off and I couldn't even find the mute button. Um, so this would be a question for the owner. Um, when the property was purchased, just to, I guess under a year ago, was it disclosed that it was um, a historic structure? It was disclosed to us that it was a, a structure of merit, that, this, that the home itself was a structure of merit. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, other commissioner questions? Mr. Chair? Commissioner Drury? Yes. Um, I'll ask, uh, I, I guess, Trish or Robert or the applicant. Um, were there any other uh, options explored, like a, a slightly taller fence with a potential for growing hedges behind it, as opposed to this sort of a monolithic wall uh, that exists today? Is that, was that unclear in my um, question? You can't see me. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> um. Yeah, Come on. Ms. Allen, Ms. Allen. I was wondering if Robert was still around because maybe he discussed that with the owner in terms of design options. I'm not sure. Um, I saw I am Drew. trying to turn on my webcam. Okay, here we go. Um, uh, I think that they built the fence and then we were looking at it and then I wanted to come up with the solution to give them the privacy but uh the option was that that i suggested is they really move that fence back on valerio but because of the oak i really like the 
fence where it is right now, just near the sidewalk, enough room for vines uh, to grow along that fence. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned about the oak and what that not only gives to the street, but what that gives them in their backyard. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, a, a notched in fence or a different kind of weird solution. We just, I like the simple, this simple possibility of greening up that fence. So it doesn't look like a fence. It looks green. That's all. Um, uh, uh, follow strands. Uh, yeah. Where would you, where would you, Sorry. where would you, excuse me, where would you get up from? Because you'd What's have that? to move the fence back to, from, from on the, on the edge of the clock. Sorry, and over I can't the hear. The edge no, of the uh, sidewalk. Actually, I'm the on. edge of the sidewalk. Okay, uh, yeah. The edge of the so sidewalk. Where would the growth come from? From where between the, the fence and the, from? Between the fence and the sidewalk, because there's eight inches of room there between okay. the okay. fence. Okay. Oh. Yeah. So it's a really good, nice situation for a vine. And, and so I guess, so we're talking about protecting the oak tree. Was there a th oak tree? What? Was, is the oak tree under threat? Is the, is the oak under threat? The oak tree under threat. N not in the current condition, but you know, but it, it's I, I not don't under know. threat. Yeah, it's protected by the fence now. But before it was not? Uh, I think before they had the lower fence and I think it was low enough it fit under some low branches. I'm not sure how they did that. Oh, well, yeah, I'm getting my... If the, if the fence is to the oak, what was threatening the oak? before maybe uh, uh nothing you're, you Go ahead. you're going in and out but i just wanted to try to cut to the chase on i think where i know where you're going uh, commissioner Drury, with it what you're saying is um what, what you know how is this fence um not threatening the oak tree now or would it if it got pushed back and i think um mr adams is saying that if the fence gets pushed back, you now get push it, are pushing it back into the branches. So now you have to, in some way, navigate that. Is that is that correct? Is that uh, a good summary? Mr. No, no. I'm trying to figure what was threatening the oak tree before this big was built. Was there a threat from the street, from passersby? No, Why it just fence built? no. It was just. There was no threat per se to the health of the oak, except people sleeping uh, near its roots, off of Chapala. Okay, yeah, thank I you. Yeah, I think there's a, a misunderstanding that the fence was built to, in a way, to protect that oak tree, but also with the goal of providing privacy and security to the backyard. So it was balancing all these um, goals. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Edmonds. Um, sorry, I thought of something else. I did walk the property yesterday. I walked, uh, you know, around the block. So I looked at both Great. the Chapala side and I looked at the Valerio side, and then I went in the backyard and walked the backyard. And it is, you know, what a nice size backyard to raise a family in. So, congratulations on that. Um, there was a hedge, and I presume it's the same hedge that is shown um, with the picket fence in front of it, but that hedge still exists on the interior of the the backyard. Not on, it, It's not a solid hedge, but there's quite a bit of it. Um, and I'm sorry that I do not recall what it was. Is it a Eugenia? Um, maybe someone could answer that question for me, and I may have another question then. It, it looked like a Eugenia. It's it's uh, too much shade is on that vine, too much shade is on that vine, and uh, so it's kind of a piecemeal vine. It's it probably 
was not meant to be a hedge uh, near the street tree or how the oak grew, but um, you know, it, need, it needs more sun. It's very shady over there with that huge street tree on Chapala near the big oak. So it's, it's a patchy hedge, but yes, it exists. Okay, and, and so that was actually gonna be my next question was um, because Eugenia can, you know, be purchased in really good size and quantity and could that not be a solution to fill in the hedge um, if you were to take down the, you know, monolithic wall, as was previously said, or fence, um, and replace it with something lower that you could fill in to provide privacy with the Eugenia. I understand you're going to have to jury rig around that oak tree somehow, but um, anyway, that's my question. Could that, and maybe you've answered it by saying it's uh, Eugenia won't work there. Yeah, we would uh, look at a different hedge material that okay. thrives in shade. Okay, so. thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Edmund. All right. Is there any other questions from any other commissioners? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So then we'll we'll switch now to uh, comments. The comment section of the of the of this item. And then, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, um, since the commissioners are proceeding with uh, their comments, I just ask them to consider um, the findings that are applicable for this project um, and really focus their comments um, on that as well. Uh, so the structure merit findings, as well as the minor zoning exception findings, um, we can have them up on the screen um, if, it's, if it's appropriate, if they'd like to see it. Thank you. And Chair Grumbine, right, thank you. Yeah. I, I'd just like to reiterate what Pilar said when you're making your motion uh, to approve or deny whatever way you go. Uh, you have to, it's not, you can't just say it doesn't meet the findings you have, or it does meet the findings. Please say the reason why you're finding that it, it does or it doesn't, as opposed to just reading through it. Thank you. Understood. All right. Thank you. Um, Okay, so I, I saw Commissioner Vena. If, would you like to um, start off with comments? Yes, I would. Uh, first of all, in looking at the overall facility, I think it's quite imposing, and I think we need a different solution as to what a, what a, what we're faced with. And in addition to that. I think the replacement of some of the additional plant materials can be put in and uh, and fill in the voids on the other side of the fence and then extend some kind of a wire fence perhaps on the other side for security and that would blend in with the hedge very quickly, some black vinyl or whatever. But I think it's very essential to maintain some semblance of the neighborhood and uh, right now it doesn't. Thank you. All right, thank you, Commissioner Ringel. Uh, Commissioner Lendvik. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, find it very unfortunate that um, we encounter these dilemmas of, of not respecting a, a, a structure of merit, uh, not respecting neighborhood and safety or or privacy uh, trump all the aesthetics of what's going on, you know, as viewed from the street. And I do think there are solutions that will probably work. Uh, I, I think a hedge line would work. Now, a hedge six foot high <clears throat> is no more legal than a fence six foot high. But hedges seem to squeak by the... Uh, uh, the authorities, whereas a fence doesn't squeak by the authorities very well. So I, I don't, I, I could not uh, support. Commissioner, I'm, I do want to clarify something on that point, um, uh, uh, and maybe staff can clarify the difference between hedge and um, fence when it comes to the height thing. Because I think there is a there is a difference, but and I want that brought out just so that we can be clear about what we're 
I'm recommending Ms. Plummer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, just to the rest of the commission. So our, um, our ordinance um, in regards to fence and hedges does, does separate the two out. Um, so hedges within required front and interior setbacks are allowed up to eight feet. Um, it's fences um, and hedges uh, within the front lot line that are that are um, next to a driveway where we require them to be limited at 42 inches. And really um, what that is is for um, driveway visibility. If a pedestrian is walking next to a driveway, we want the hedge or fence to be low enough um, so that a driver can see a pedestrian walking along the sidewalk. Um, but yes, there is a difference uh, between hedges and fences uh, along the front lot line. If you're if you're not adjacent to a driveway and you're outside the driveway visibility triangle, which is a 10 by 10 triangle um, adjacent to the driveway, hedges are allowed to go up to eight feet and can receive additional height with a minor zoning exception. That is different from a fence. A fence along the front lot line, and like we're reviewing today, is always at 42 inches unless it receives a minor zoning exception. So, I mean, if you have any additional questions, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, Commissioner Lindick. Yeah, th there was a time in the city of Santa Barbara where hedges were controlled the same way fences are in front yards. And that may have changed in the last number of years. In any case, I find the, I find the fence that is existing to be inappropriate um, and uh, incompatible with the, the, the Historic house that's there, and the and the setting that is um, necessary for that historic house. And as I could not support uh, any waiver on allowing fence uh, of that height within the ten foot setback of either street. Okay, thank you, um, uh, Commissioner House. Well, I always try and start out with some positive comment whenever I can, and that's rather difficult in this right. situation. Um, the most thing I can, the most positive thing I can say is that I sympathize with your issue of people sleeping on your property. I live downtown and I deal with that all the time as well. However, I don't think that the solution is for Santa Barbara to become um, a community of walled um, bastions and, and there really needs to be, I mean, it's so incompatible with the neighborhood. Um, the setting has just been destroyed by this thing. It's just atrocious. I'm sorry. That's what I have to say about it. Um, I think that I would be much more amenable to a solution that was a less solid fence that was perhaps two by two pickets at about six inches on center with the hedge behind, probably a different hedge that survives better in the shade. That instantly has a much softer feel and still gives you some protection. I mean, I recognize the difficulty of having any other configuration of fence plan with that oak tree there. I mean, there's just no way unless you went nearly back to the house to have a, a taller fence wrap around the tree on the other side. But um, the neighborhood is is characterized by a number of hedges that those showed in one of the pictures uh, we were shown. There are a number of taller hedges. A vine on a fence just does not have the same feel. It doesn't have the depth to it. And I would really be concerned about the very negligible planting space between the fence and the sidewalk. Um, I don't recall it being very much. We don't really have any good pictures that show it, but you know that space is already filled with roots of the existing uh, hedge. So I, I just don't know how well a vine is going to successfully cover that fence. Uh, so I, I can't support this at all. Uh, I think there's another solution um, and I think that they need to go back to the drawing board and come up with uh, some other solution that we can discuss. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Uli. Um, I too, as Commissioner House uh, expressed, 
uh, have great empathy uh, for the owner and you know needing privacy. You know, my neighbor died a couple of years ago across the street, and he had a tall fence that um, surrounded his property. He lives on the corner, very much like this property. A uh, very nice woman bought that property and uh, put some money into improving it. When she tore the old fence down, she wasn't allowed to put a new fence up that matched it. She had to do a fence that was 42 inches high. And of course, she has no privacy in her backyard. I don't know if she had a dog. I don't know what she would do, put the dog on a rope or something. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> so I empathize. Um, really, I suggest uh, that that probably means that we ought to really take a serious look at that and find out why, why we can't have taller fences and barriers uh, on uh, single family residential properties that, have, that provide privacy in the backyard. All that being said, uh, we do have rules and the rules say that, um, that you can't have a barrier that is higher than 42 inches. Um, and for me, um, uh, I, I can't support uh, the current fence. I suppose we're gonna be haggling over this for quite some time because I'm sure the fence isn't gonna come down anytime soon until we iron all this out. Um, a potential solution um, that I was thinking about, if you put the site plan up, um, you know, it, what I think in my opinion, what we really lose uh, is the corner context of seeing um, the house at the corner with the palm tree and, you know, that fence just simply shuts that down. Um, and it would, I would suggest that uh, if we're gonna provide any kind of direction that the fence facing Valerio Street actually come back behind the palm tree so that we get that corner context back. I don't think we're real, in my opinion, we're really losing much by having a taller fence along Chapala Street, um, even though the rules say you can't have one. Um, the rules also say that you can ask for a variance to add four feet to it. So, you know, at the end of the day, six months from now, two months from now, two weeks from now, are we going to approve a fence that's taller? I probably would have approved a fence had it come in and they asked permission before. Um, you know, it's always uh, uh, troubling when somebody comes in and says, well, I didn't think I had to, but can you let me have it now? Uh, you know, asking forgiveness um, oftentimes doesn't doesn't work, um, but this is the case now. Um, those are my suggestions, but I, I can't support it the way it is submitted. Okay, Commissioner Hedman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think that the the building is the the home is beautiful and it's a real treasure and unfortunately the fence completely detracts and takes away from it's not that so much that you can't see the home like you could previously with the picket fence it's just so incongruous it um it's it's a reminds me of a tract house i i lived in when i was in fourth grade in in uh, santa maria and um, it just it doesn't feel right for uh, downtown santa barbara and so um, the reason I asked the question about how long the owners have been in the house or, um, is because those are the types of, in my opinion, things that you think about when you purchase a home and, and that you need to deal with. Um, you know, I, I too have children and a dog. And so I completely empathize on that regard, in that regard, but I, I just can't support the fence as it is in its cur current um, stage. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner, uh, let's see, Commissioner's Mayhem. Mayhem, yeah. Commissioner's Mayhem. Yes, I'm here. Um, um, my feeling was as I drove up Chapala Street approaching this block, uh, the, the fence was very much inappropriate to the neighborhood. And, and it also is inappropriate and incompatible with the architecture on the on the lot. So I don't think there's any way that I could support a modification. 
and I think that there is a solution, but it's a, it's going to have to be a creative solution, and the, and the owner and the uh, landscape architect are going to have to go in to to the, the appropriateness of the the architecture in the neighborhood. And uh, I'll be looking forward to seeing a, a Okay, thank you, Mr. Mahan. I think I think you um, were are off now. I think you were done. But um, if you weren't, you can jump back on. Um, all right. So, Commissioner Drury, do you want to weigh in? Hello, Commissioner Drury. Am I unmuted? Yes, I am. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll start over. Um, I've got about five or f 15 minutes to talk and, uh, you know, so I wouldn't, I, I can't support the, the uh, fence as, as presented. I think that with uh, the, the skills that Mr. Adams has in the landscape that he can come up with a much more elegant solution because that, as I said in, in uh, early on, it's just a monolithic fence with no poetry, no charm, no relationship to the, the existing structure, the structure of merit. It's, it's unsupportable for me. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, all right, did we miss anyone? Okay, so I, and I guess I would echo uh, much of the, of the other commissioner, what other commissioners have said. Um, I think that, uh, from my opinion, and, and I think there's going to be a variation here, but my opinion is, um, if there was a, some breathing setback and, and having walked the property after, uh, first seeing the, the project at, um, uh, consent, um, that, uh, it, it, the, it, it is out of character for the neighborhood and it does feel very, uh, harsh and hard, um, and, um, yeah, just out of, out of character. And even though hedges, all, all do that are right along the property line. Um, they just have a much, they, they do a similar screening. Of, they'll screen the, the building the same in terms of visually oftentimes, um, but they, they just feel a lot softer and a lot more in keeping with um, a soft landscape as opposed to a hard surface that you, um, that you walk along. Um, and I totally appreciate, and um, I definitely, as well as other commissioners said, empathize with um, the, the desire to, just have um, a protection from um, from outside influences that are um, that are were unknown and undesirable, and so it was. I totally understand on the, on that side of things, but I do think that I could see it being what within the ten foot um, uh, setback. Um, I, I could see it being with a with a modification, but uh, um, in my opinion, I think it has to be at least like three or four feet back before it starts to become um, and and covered with. Um, a hedge or something um, uh, uh, strong and plant-like before it feels like you're letting that corner or letting the sidewalk breathe because it's really right, right tight to the sidewalk. So um, that's my um, where where my thoughts are are landing as well. Um, so, but I I know as well that um, at the at the um, uh, on consent there was um, a discussion that the the. Um, the owner wanted us to, to deny the project so that it, it could be appealed um, rather than going coming um, back multiple times for or uh, coming back again with a different design. So I do want to um, to bring that up, uh, bring up the option for things so that we don't um, uh, keep pushing things down the road um, if they don't if they do not want um, to uh, come back and they don't don't want to try to. Um, rework that side um, or the the uh, Chapala side as well. Um, I I want to give that as an option so that we don't um, uh, yeah don't waste everyone's time. So um, if the applicant and oh yeah, Miss Plummer, do you want? Uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, I think it would be appropriate at this time to ask the applicant um, if they are okay. Um, uh, with a continuance to study solutions or if they want a decision at this hearing. So I'll leave that to them. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So app applicant. Okay. There we go. Yeah. 
All right. So I'm, I'm doing the same thing I did two weeks ago and um, communicating via text while I'm listening to okay. you. So thanks for all the Understood. time and, and working with us. Um, I've asked uh, Mr. Almeizaga to uh, get back into the participation if, if he would do so to answer your question because it's really his decision. Right. Um, I have my recommendation. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, um, we can hear you. Why don't we try to come back and see if we can come up with a different solution? And if it if it means you know replacing the fence with a smaller fence or or relocating it somehow or coming up with a better hedge solution or something like that, you know, why don't we give that a try? Okay. Great. Okay. So um, so let's um, that, 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 oh yeah go go ahead. Commissioner Grumbine, um, any suggestions off, off the top of your head that you might have? I know I, I know you mentioned a, a softer yeah. landscape. Um, so uh, he, here's what I was hearing enough? from the other from, from the other commissioners. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, do, I don't want this yeah. to be a back and forth thing. They've indicated yeah. uh, what they want. Yeah. So just make sure when you're uh, when whoever makes a motion they summarize in detail the recommendations from the commission thank you yeah, so also include yeah, uh, so. why the current is inappropriate thank you sorry what was that last part before uh, so, Mr. Chair, I would suggest that whoever the motion maker is uh, they express why the current design of the fence um, as it mm -hmm. as it exists today is not appropriate and summarize the reasons why and then also provide uh, details about what would be appropriate um, or just say you know that what sort of suggestions you think are appropriate to include in that motion for the applicant to study and return with at a later date thank you great thank you okay all right so back to the commission uh, for um, uh, discussion and a motion would anyone like to um, so I, I can I can summarize oh, why don't I take a shot at summarizing the comments and then the maker of whoever wants to make a motion can make it with those comments and or add or subtract things as they see fit um, so what um, could we staff can we pull up at the site plan again okay so, um, so these are the, so the, the following comments were, um, uh, were, were, were said and, and so I'll, I'll reiterate them. Um, so the, um, there wasn't, uh, too much discussion. There wasn't a lot of discussion on the, on the Valerio street solution, um, except for that. Uh, and so actually maybe we should start with that is, um, because, the, I think the Chapala street the Chapala Street discussion is was pretty clear um, and, and not acceptable as as it as it was shown, um, and the corner condition as well was brought up, but there wasn't a lot of discussion about the Valeria Street solution of moving the head moving the fence back um, and having planting in front. And whether people whether commissioners thought that that was um, uh, an, a supportable solution or something headed in the right direction. So, Commissioner Uli, do you want to weigh in on that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would offer for the commission's consideration that the fence along Valerio Street uh, be pulled back uh, to maybe the deck area uh, so that the, uh, the Canary Island date palm and a little more landscaping on that corner uh, helps to expose the corner of the building. Okay. All right. Any other com uh, commissioner comments on about the Valerio Street side? And uh, just to confirm, you, do you mean to the deck? You mean to the, to the face of the house, or to the? Oh, all the way to the deck. Oh, I see. You're saying to the back. Yeah, back see uh, little, yeah. See that little door there. Uh, that gets. Gotcha. Yeah, that gets that Valerio uh, Street uh, fence behind. Uh, the canary palm opens that corner up a little bit. I think we'd see more of the building. 
Um, although to just clarify that, if I'm understanding the graphic right, and maybe I'm not, not I think that the um, the setback on that is only comes to the like halfway between the. Yeah, if we can zoom in. Yeah, it, and it, I. It comes to the trunk of the palm. Yeah, right there. That's Luke. where the. Are, so are you saying take it to the full setback on the front, or yeah. or beyond the full front? Yeah. Okay. Setback. Okay. On more the Valeria on, side. Yeah, more ideally to where the Japala Street vertical fence makes the 45 degree turn. Just turn it there and hit the house. You know, we're only talking about another gotcha. foot. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So, but the main thing is beyond the, the palm tree. So the palm tree is in front. It's in the front, basically equi the equivalent of the front yard. Correct. That's kind of how the white picket fence was although the little white picket fence was in front of the palm yeah it was but it was the little part of it that was um made it visible over okay so um all right other commissioners uh thoughts on the valeria street side here and Okay, I, I just was waiting for permission. Um, yeah, sorry, Commissioner Evans, followed by Commissioner Drury. You know, I, I liked how it was before. Um, I liked the fact that the fence was contiguous. I, I understand Commissioner Uli's suggestion and the reason for it, but I'm afraid that, in my opinion, it kind of um, it breaks up the building. So if, if, uh, if a vote was put to me as to which I would prefer. I would prefer the way it was before versus the new suggestion. Thank you. The, uh, sorry, just to be clear, um, the what, um, Commissioner Edmonds, so the way it was before <coughs> being low, but all the way in front of everything. Yes, that the fence went around, wrapped around, you know, Valerio to Chapala, that it was the, the same fencing. I like you mean the, the low fence. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a picket fence in front of it, but I like the look of of it all being the same. All right. First, not sure, having uh, a fence in Rio and having one on Chapala. Okay, so but uh, to be clear, <coughs> their their uh, proposal is to pull back the six foot high current one that exists, pull it back from the sidewalk um, uh, on Valerio's side to the basically the house almost to the, the front of the house, which is a couple feet. Um, uh, and then run it, in, run it um, on the outside, uh, on the sidewalk side of the, of the palm tree, and then down. And what you're saying is you um, prefer the, the low fence as it was out in, right at the sidewalk um, all the way around. Well, let me ask a question because I don't recall there being sufficient room to pull it back. I mean, what? I, unfortunately, I'm sorry. I cannot read the distance between the sidewalk. Can we, can we zoom building. in a little, a little more on this, uh, um, staff? Yeah, can we zoom in there? Yeah, get, get closer. Yeah, so, if you go, I think, so I, I think the key, uh, and I, one of the things I want to try to make sure we do is give some direction. I think that that um, judging by different comments, there's probably going to be different commissioners are going to be okay with certain solutions and not okay with others. And I, I think we want we do want to give them at least some direction uh, an indication of um, a general solutions that might be acceptable. Um, and so, if the only thing that you as the commissioner would accept is taking it 10 feet back, then you, I think you need to say that so they they know that. Um, and and then the maker of the motion, however they want to craft it, um, to get the support enough to pass it is the next question. But um, I think it is important because we're we're just we we all are in agreement that it's not a um, the, the fence in general is not an acceptable solution as proposed. Um, but there are two different there are a couple different conditions, and if you speak to what you support and don't support about them, um, I think that could be helpful for the designer going forward. Yeah. Mr. Well. Mr. Chair, I just, um, we are running quite a bit yeah. behind time on this item and I want to remind the commission, you don't need to design this for the applicant. Um, I would suggest just providing general information is appropriate, but um, more, more than that is not necessary. You know, that's, that's up to the applicant to design based on your comments. Thank you. 
Commissioner right. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, hold on, Commissioner Lennox. Commissioner Drury was next, and then you, and then we'll we'll wrap up and get get a motion going. Commissioner Drury. Oh, oh dear. Oh dear. Wait. Oh God. Am I? Am I? Oh yeah. Um, I just couldn't find my screen. <laughs> I I have nothing to add. Thank you. Okay. That was easy, Commissioner Lendvik. Yeah, yes, Mr. Chair, I don't believe we should be attempting to verbalize a design for the applicant. He has heard uh, an hour or more of discussion on our part. We've given this more time than we give to a lot of residences and commercial buildings. I believe that we should just take action if he wants it continued. They have heard what we've said. I think they understand what our concerns are and they've got to come up with a solution. I don't believe we should be just verbalizing a design. Okay, I all right, thank the, you, Commissioner Lemmick. No. Commissioner Lemmick, oh, thank you. I, I, I want to summarize some of our comments and then we can go from there. So, I don't think you need uh, to summarize the, them, they're on TV. You don't okay. need to summarize I know, them. But, but normally we do. And I think that that's a proper, a proper courtesy. Um, okay, so the uh, the comments that, were, that I've, I've heard um, uh, repeated by multiple commissioners is that they do not, if you can go back to the site plan, um, is that, is that the, um, the, the, the design solution on, on all fronts is not acceptable as submitted. Um, some of the key concerns were on Chapala street, um, having a, it feel like a wall along the sidewalk and uh, on the at the corner, um, having the importance of the view of the historic resource um, from both uh, from, from not just the front side, but from that corner as well, which was um, which was a, a prominent thing before. Um, and uh, and I think that those are. Um, let's see if there's anything else that was key in terms of oh. Uh, was also that it was incompatible with the neighborhood, um, uh, the, especially the fence being um, solid and being right on the property, right on the sidewalk. Um, and those were the main uh, key comments that I think still need to be um, resolved, or, or I heard need to be resolved. So, Commissioner Uli. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Commissioner Limvik, for trying to keep us on the straight and narrow. Uh, <clears throat> according to the agenda, um, this minor zoning exception is part of our action. And so I'm wondering, uh, you know, to what degree the commission is comfortable with, um, with allowing a taller fence of whatever design comes back um, or not. Um, so, Mr. Commissioner House? Well, I would say that I, for one, am not opposed to considering um, uh, a zoning variance for an overheight fence. Um, it really just depends upon the entirety of the, uh, uh, of the proposal and the materials, the plants, uh, the height, the look, you know, it, it needs to find a better uh, consistency with the neighborhood. Uh, and I would agree with those comments, Commissioner House. Uh, and would anyone not agree with that comment? Okay, so I think um, Commissioner Uli, you have your, your answer for that in terms of it being um, possibly supportable. With the right design. Um, so is there, with so and so we, we can add that comment in as well. Um, if there are any, um, anyone would like to make a motion or would like to add, to add additional discussion to get a motion? I'll make a motion. All right. Let's see if it gets a second. I move we deny the request for a minor zoning exception to allow a six foot fence within 10 foot of the property line as presented to us. The reason for the denial is the fence as presented to us is out of character with the structure of merit home, as well as the neighborhood 
uh, period, it is uh, also an imposition on the streetscape on both Chapala and Valerio Street. Second. Okay. Uh, second by Mr. jury. Mr. Second. Chair, I just oh, wanted to get a clarification. The applicant uh, said they would be comfortable with an indefinite continuance to come back with different solutions. Um, so how it sounded with your motion was that you're motioning I, I, for a denial, not a continuance. So I just wanted to clarify. It's, it's a denial of the fence as presented to us at its location. There's nothing in the in the denial which would prevent them from coming back with a different solution. So yeah. be a so denial just without to prejudice. Be, hold, hold on, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Plummer. Ms. Plummer. For, yeah. for the record, a denial is different than an indefinite continuance to say that the fence as designed is not acceptable. So I just want to be clear of the language. Are you are you requesting a denial or indefinite continuance because the fence I'm, is my motion was for a denial of the fence as presented. All right. So, so just Miss Ostringer. Yes, Chair Crumbine, Commissioner, so to be clear, that will uh deny the project and a new application would need to be submitted. They won't be able to come back with you under this original application. So, and typically we typically we we don't deny projects unless as a as a pure denial unless we're we're saying absolutely um not not that we're not happy with a, a design at all because we do that all the time but just well, that if we do a denial it means that they have to appeal if they want to mr chair mr chair yeah someone can make a mr. substitute mr. motion some someone can make a substitute motion mr. or someone chair, can make a second or deny it, it. Mm -hmm. okay. mr mr, mr. Howard. Mr. Chair, I'd like to withdraw my second. I did not know okay. this information. All right. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Drury. So Commissioner House. Motion. Let's take another another half hour in this project, okay? All I'm right. trying to uh, hurry things along, Commissioner Lendick. As am I. All right. Commissioner House. <laughs> okay. So this would be a motion for an indefinite continuance with the comment that the commission cannot support the fence as presented because it's incompatible with the neighborhood and with the historic resource. And uh, the applicant should return with an alternative proposal that is more consistent with the uh, appearance of the current fence um, in terms of uh, including hedge material and uh, uh, I don't want to get too specific. Um, let's see. Help me out here. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So, uh, and uh, we I don't think we necessarily need to get specific because, um, yeah, exactly. but it, just in terms of, I, I do think the the one piece that was, um, I think that you haven't hit quite yet on is the corner, the views with respect to the views as well of the resource from the corners that, that that corner view through the palm tree was a was one of the items that was discussed that if, if you want to include that in your motion I which would yeah, which would be part of being consistent with the uh uh the, the, the feeling of the existing fence but yeah we could state that that the objective the design objective um is to maintain the sense of openness to the view of the historic resource and not feel as much as a solid wall as the current proposal does. Second. All right. All right. Who is that seconded by? Willie. No, he's quick. Jeez. <laughs> uh, before you vote, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Under discussion. Sure okay. Anything. Thank you. Um, and maybe this is for staff, but my concern about an indefinite continuance is that nothing will happen and the fence will just stay there. And so how does that work? So Mr. Chair, and then to Commissioner Edmonds, um, this property um, was given a notice of violation uh, for the existing fence. So they need to take appropriate action and there are timelines that are given by the zoning enforcement officer for them to come back to the HLC um, and basically go through the process. Um, so they will need to come back, yes to address that, to address that enforcement case. So technically it's not really indefinite then. 
just to make me feel better. <laughs> well, yeah, we, we just, it's either, either going to be next in two weeks or it's indefinite, right? So we, we only have the, the two okay. categories. Thank so, you. yeah. All right. Um, okay. So commissioner, so now I, I guess, yeah. Do I need and to now make findings or is that only when we give it? No, approval? no, we're just, no, nope, it's indefinite continuous. I, I don't believe you have to make any findings. And, you and Mr. Okay. Chair, there are no findings since it's an indefinite continuance. Thank okay. you. So you're you got you got easy street yeah okay yeah. so all those all right so if we can do a roll call and vote this is Heidi Rydell I will conduct the roll call vote Commissioner Grumbine or uh, Chair Grumbine aye aye Vice Chair House yes Commissioner Drury aye Commissioner Edmonds yes. Commissioner Lundvik? Yes. Commissioner Mahan? Commissioner Mahan, are you able to unmute yourself so we can hear your vote? I don't see him on the list. Um. Yeah, I don't see him. I don't, I'm listed. sorry, I don't see him currently. Yeah, he, we might have lost him, so we can mark him as absent for this vote. It's five o'clock in Scottsdale. Um, Commissioner right. Lindsay? Yes. And Commissioner Vania? Yes. All right, the vote is unanimous, and with, uh, Commissioner Mahan as absent. All right. All right, thank you, um, and thank you, applicant. Uh, all right, so now we will move on to item six, 433 East Cabrillo Boulevard for in-progress review. This is a proposal for an 86-room hotel project uh, composed of two parcels, a three-acre hotel site, um, and adjacent uh, 2.4-acre parking lot site. I'm Kaya Peter Chavez. The hotel site is within the EPV, um, and uh, the other is outside with an ABR jurisdiction. The hotel site is currently permitted for a 150-room hotel. Um, the proposed is a revised design for a smaller development at the hotel site consisting of two and three-story structures. The proposed square footage on this lot is approximately 88,000 square feet. Program elements include uh, casual and fine dining, wine cellar lounge, rooftop swimming pool, and bar, spa, banquet room, water features, and gardens. Automobile and pedestrian access to the hotel will be made from Calle Cesar Chavez via motor court and accessible sidewalk at a reception pavilion. This is for an in-progress review. No final appealable decision will be made at this hearing. The project was last reviewed on October 16, 2019. All right. So welcome. Uh, why don't we do staff comments, and then um, we'll read the, uh, via the notes from um, the last time, and and then we'll have um, the presentation. All right. Chair Grumman. Yes, Ms. Ostringer. Is it was that Ms. Ostringer? That yeah. Okay. It was. Thank you, uh, Chair and Commissioners. I wanted to thank you for your time today, but I'll be needing to leave the meeting, so I will see you all at our next meeting. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye, Dave. All right, Ms. Um, Ms. All right. Mr. Chair. Oh, wait, sorry. Who who is that? It's uh, oh. that's Stealthy Uli. Commissioner Uli. Yes. Okay. I uh, just wanted to uh, state for the record that uh, I viewed all the videotapes and all the previous actions on the matter. And Have then, you had uh, nothing to do for the last month. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, as far right, as staff Ms. comments Park. go, uh, my comments are really brief. Um, I'm sure Ms. Tellage will go into this a little bit more um, in the applicant portion of the presentation. Um, but this project uh, is back on for an in-progress review. It was last reviewed on October 16th, 2019, um, and was forwarded um, to Planning Commission, um, you know, after the commission had previously reviewed it and determined that the plans aesthetically were in substantial conformance with the project design approval set of plans. Um, and it is my understanding that the applicant is going to be coming back before this commission with a few in progress reviews, really fleshing out all the details as they move towards final approval. 
Um, so I'll leave it to the applicant to discuss those. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, um, so now I'll go back to our, um, our notes from the previous, um, our, yeah, so previous, oh, sorry, yeah, our previous motion was um, for an indefinite continuance of planning commission um, that, that we found, and we found that the changes to be in substantial conformance. Okay, um, and it was Mahan 401, uh, Mahan and Nemec and House abstained, Uli Drury and Baina and, and Edmonds were absent, the motion carried. All right, so that was that was the, the just check that the, it was substantially conforming to the previous um, version of the project, correct? Okay. All right. So, um, if you would wouldn't mind introducing yourselves for the record and take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Am I on? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm clear. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's nice to be with you and with the rest of the commissioners. It's been a while, so um, it's nice to see you all again. <laughs> um, I'm Suzanne Elledge, representing the Robert Green Company. And just to add a little more context to the review that you both just made um, of where we were last fall and the status of where the project is currently. We had two meetings with you last fall. The first one, uh, you met the new hotel developer, Robert Green who has extensive experience developing luxury hotels. And we explained that the project was being revised to increase the room count by 26 rooms, but was staying within the same height and essentially within the same footprint as the previously approved hotel, same architectural style and so forth. At the second meeting, as was just said on October 16th, you found that this revised project substantially conformed to the previous project that you gave PDA to in November of 2018. Subsequent to our meeting with you last fall, we filed our substantial conformance determination application package that's been under review since then. Um, and we are, it's targeted to go to planning commission for their advisory comments on June 4th. And the project is subject to a development agreement, which requires that we submit our building permit um, application package to the building department by June 23rd of this year. So as Ms. Plummer mentioned, we have a series of meetings scheduled with you all to go through the project in various pieces and parts. And um, our design team will give you a little bit more information about how we intend to do that um, over the next couple of months. And we're hoping that we would be before you for final approval on June 10th at the June 10th hearing. So um, before turning it over to the design team, I want to just let you know that we've got a couple of new design team members. Um, Kirk Ellis with Gensler, who is the architect of record, who just raised his hand. And, <laughs> and Joel Harms, who will be appearing shortly, um, who is with Burton Design Lance uh, Studio and is the landscape architect for the project. And they are joining Bob Glazier, who continues on as the design architect, um, as well as Christine Perrone, who has um, already been working on the project and will continue to work with Bob and Gensler um, as a design consultant. So unless there are other questions for me, I'm just going to turn it over to Bob. We have a lot to accomplish today, and you guys are already running late. So <laughs> let's get going. Thank you, Suzanne. So uh, we can do this in 20 minutes. We've been asked to do it in 20 minutes. Uh, 30 minutes might be better, but given your last case, I think we should keep to 20 minutes. Uh, and then if we have extra time, time we can go back and uh, do things in more detail. Um, just an overview of what we'll be presenting today, uh, the current uh, CAD uh, floor plans, I'm sorry, Revit floor plans. Uh, these are all CD documents now. Uh, we are definitely in construction documents, uh, details including wall thicknesses, uh, which you'll see in a diagram here shortly. And we also went through and uh, given this new format, we took all the previously approved uh, HLC CAD elevations and we put them above the uh, latest uh, construction document Revit elevation, so you can see the before and after. There's very, very few changes. We'll point out some uh, areas where they are slightly changed uh, for you to 
you to see uh, balcony details, including uh, all of our solid stock uh, railings and sections uh, in one detail, which I love, and that is the uh, connection of the balcony railing behind the stucco. If you look at any George Washington Smith house, uh, the balcony connections are always behind the stucco. You don't see great big plates uh, where the balconies are connected to the uh, front of the building. We'll be presenting roof and eave details, ridge details, and a wonderful detail that I love, the engaged pots, uh, pot and wall detail, uh, which, uh, <laughs> which is a very tricky detail to pull off. Uh, I know uh, Kirk and his team have done that and uh, very happy with that detail. Uh, if we do something that's uh, on the building, we want to make sure it's historically accurate and correct. So you'll see all those details today. We will not be presenting, and this is important, the awning locations. We want to do that when we present all the colors and materials and have one complete uh, presentation to you with all the colors, colors and materials. Uh, the uh, finishes and the balconies and all that will be one presentation, uh, which will be the next uh, four weeks here. We also want to uh, exclude today the vent uh, and chimney exhaust details. Uh, we have all the right locations. They are shown properly on all of our elevations, but we don't want to go over the details just yet. They're close, but not enough uh, for you to, uh, to consider for today. We are not showing you the entry uh, retail building. Uh, it's very, very similar, but it's not finished enough to show you today. And a very strange detail to mention uh, on this, and that is a, a weak screen detail. Uh, we feel very strongly that uh, the stucco should not stop eight inches above the dirt and then uh, a setback of uh, three inches, and then you'll see the concrete foundation. We want the stucco to go right down into the dirt as you would have seen in any historic uh, Spanish colonial building from the 19, uh, 1920s. Quickly, the proposed uh, presentation over the next couple months, uh, next two months actually, uh, May 13th, we wanna show you the roof deck, which you haven't really seen before. We also wanna show you what that means, the chimney and roof details. May 27th, we wanna show you all the exterior materials, finishes, um, uh, which is, uh, we'd like to do all together and not uh, do it in piecemeal. And you'll see that very soon here. On June 10th, we wanna go through all the revised details from previous meetings, meeting comments. You, any comment you've made, we wanna go back and show you the new, new, de new details or new uh, 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 drawings for that. And then as Suzanne said, on June 23rd, we want to submit for building permit. So we have a very uh, tight schedule here. We know we can do it. Um, and let's just jump right into it. First thing we'd like to show you are the floor plans. And again, these are all now uh, construction document floor plans. And I'll do this very quickly since we wanna really get into the elevations here. So we could jump to the uh, floor plans that are in. Page, page three, of the package you have up, please. Mm -hmm. I'm used to turning pages myself. Yeah, right? I know. I miss Miss Plummer or whoever's can. There we go. Great. There we go. Thank you very much. Great. A really quick review. Um, we're going to show you uh, later on uh, the uh, complete landscape plans, uh, the new uh, plans that were based on all the approved landscape plans. Just a quick reminder: top of the screen there, that uh, round circle, is the entry court, and right next to the entry court is the pedestrian entry under that loggia, which is just south of it. Uh, obviously. Uh, north is up uh, ocean is down the entry is exactly the same spot this is a place where we uh, actually took the entire building and turned it towards stern's wharf so when you arrive uh, uh, for the first time you look out and you will see stern's wharf very important to us uh, off to the side is the ballroom and the ballroom loggia and the gardens that go beyond one of the, some of the most important spaces in this whole project are not so much the inside spaces but the outside spaces and as you know uh, this grand courtyard is composed of a series of courtyards. So a lot of outdoor spaces uh, and uh, you'll, I'm sure you'll find Joel's presentation very interesting. Down on the lower right-hand side is, sorry, left-hand side is the restaurant, all the same as before. Almost no changes to the plan on the outside and all the changes have been on the inside footprint. If you go to the next floor plan, I do want to mention one thing on this though. We added an elevator. It's an express elevator. You can see it. If you see grid line C1 and C2, we added a, a express elevator on C2. Uh, you'll see that in a second. And that is the, really the only main thing that changes the outside of this building. If we go to the next plan, you'll see the spa. 
and that is on uh, between grids, grid lines C11 and C2, and that is pretty much the same. We will not be talking about the spa elevation today, and we'll show you why in just a second. And then we can go to the top floor, and this is the third floor. And this is, uh, you can see here the idea of, and something we talked about the very first time we met with you, that is having two-story facades along Cabrillo, two-story facades along Cesar Chavez. And you can see that with all the roof forms because the, the higher part of the building, of course, is in the back part of the site. Again, almost exactly the same plans with the exception of the uh, express elevator, which is right next to the two guest room elevators. Top floor, uh, if you go one story up, you'll see what we're going to pre be presenting next time, which is the roof plan, which you've never really seen before. And uh, this is just a preview of what you'll see in a couple of weeks. And the next we'd like to go to the first of the diagram showing wall thicknesses. Obviously with this style building, it's, I think it's right after this. Gonna, with this style building, it. it's all Excuse about, me. oh, sorry. Sorry about the wall types. I'm sorry, Ms. Palmer, if you could change over one of our supplemental uh, submittals. There you go, thank you. Please continue, Bob, sorry. No problem. So I love I love these drawings. This is something Kirk and his team put together. And anytime you see a blue wall, uh, these walls are one foot nine inches thick. As we've always told you, the bigger the opening, the thicker the wall. Uh, we've gone through now and detailed all these walls. Anything where you're going to see the thickness of the wall is one foot nine inches thick. Very happy with this. We spent many days with uh, uh, Christine and the Gensler team to uh, document all this. We measured many buildings um, uh, all around State Street and had lots of fun doing that. So all the blue walls are, are nice thick walls. All the green walls or lime green walls are one foot two inches thick. Uh, uh, these are smaller openings. They're not as big. So we made those thinner. As I said, smaller the opening, the, uh, the thinner the wall, the bigger the opening, the thicker the wall. It's a very simple idea and we've carried it through in all the floor plans. If we jump to the next floor, you can see that again, blue is thick, green is still thick at one foot two inches. And of course the pink walls or whatever color that is, is uh, all the walls where uh, you have doors and windows. Next exhibit is the top floor. Same idea. Uh, many of these walls are have smaller openings, so they have thinner walls uh, with the exception of the wall you can see on the lower left-hand side there, uh, which is one of the main walls visible from the lobby. If we jump now to the supplemental exhibit that we put together, and uh, we went through a couple different, uh, couple different uh, trial and errors on this, uh, we want to make sure these two elevations are close together so you can see them on your screen uh, with this new presentation format. Uh, when we're all together, we can flip pages back and forth, but we don't have much, uh, too much ability, ability to do that. So what you're seeing now are on the top. These are the elevations you saw last time. They're all CAD. Uh, elevations, they are design development level elevations. And then on the bottom are our current elevation. These are all Revit uh, elevations. Uh, and we will take you through right now and show you any uh, deviation that we have from your approved elevations last uh, fall to where we are today. So starting off with uh, this elevation, I don't, know how, I don't know how easy it's going to be to tell you this, but on the uh, top, we see B15 on the current Revit elevation, the bottom elevation. You can see we're able to lower the mechanical penthouse for the elevators, uh, which has been lowered significantly. Very happy with that. And you can see right next to it on the right-hand side, the idea of uh, the penthouse for the new uh, express elevator. You'll see, uh, or maybe you did see on the plans, this is embedded in the middle of the building. It's not on the facade uh, and it's, uh, uh, it will not obviously be seen like that, but it's an elevator we did add. On um, the theater elevation, you'll see one minor change. We're working on the column capital. So if you see on grid line B15 on the bottom elevations, we do not have the column capitals there and we may not add column capitals there. We're going through and studying that right now. Uh, you may re remember Commissioner uh, Lenvik's suggestion, I mean, sorry, uh, Mahan's suggestion between B13 and B14 on the Revit elevations to have a, enough of a thick wall there. You might remember the first, first presentation we gave to you uh, we had pushed to Lozier over on the third floor. Uh, Commissioner Mahan suggests we pull it back, show more solid wall there, and we're doing that. Above the entry where the three arches are, you'll see a balcony. We'll talk about those details in a, in a second. It's inspired by, but not copied, uh, the, one of my favorite balconies on State Street. It's the building that has the engaged pots 
and the loggia on the top floor. Wonderful building, and you'll see those details in just a, just a second. And if you have a really big screen, you can see that the windowsill on the curved tower uh, between B7 and B8 is missing, and we're still detailing that, and we're going to show you that at the next presentation. If you go to the next, next uh, slide, again, uh, the uh, CAD DD drawing is on top that you approved. Our latest drawing is on the bottom, the Revit drawing, which is a CD level drawing. Uh, a couple of minor things here. We actually added a little bit of wall space above the uh, elliptical arches on the ground floor. It was about three inches uh, to give enough wall space above that arch before we, uh, for the opening above. We also, um, what else did we do here? We also slightly raised, and you can see it uh, for the presidential suite between grid lines A8 and A11, slightly raised the uh, outside wall there and covered up a bit of the presidential suite. Again, this is a two-story facade that we're showing you on, C on Cesar Chavez. On, uh, if you look at grid lines A3 and A4, we're still working out a jogging detail. If you look at the elevation above, the roof does jog there. We're studying that right now. And that's really it. And everything else uh, you're seeing is an exact copy of what you saw uh, last fall. If we jump to see the Cabrillo elevation, I have a timer going here and I'm slightly behind right now. <laughs> So you might remember uh, you asked us to take off a landscape wall that does exist on the uh, uh, east or the right-hand side of the screen. That is the Cabrillo elevation where the elliptical arches are on top. If you look at the bottom elevation on the lower right-hand side of the screen, you can see that we added a little bit of wall thickness, just like we did on the Cesar Chavez elevation to make that a little bit thicker on the top. Again, there would be a landscape wall here, so you wouldn't see this full arch. Uh, but you did ask us to take it off on the last the last presentation. There's a slight detail that doesn't exist on H, H5. Yes, H5, uh, where the roof breaks, We're working on that detail as well. And then if you jump over to the other side where the restaurant is, also on Cabrillo, obviously, we'd like to simplify these columns uh, and use, Val, the, if you know Valverde uh, in Montecito, uh, as inspiration and not do uh, fancy uh, precast column. Uh, we had always shown you uh, some different ideas for this, but having studied this, we'd like to do something that's, uh, I think, a little bit simpler. Uh, feel very good about that and uh, not do the precast columns. If you've seen the Santa Barbara Inn that has precast columns, we want to differenti differentiate ourselves slightly from that and keep this a pretty simple uh, square, square column. If you look at the uh, chimney cap, on the two before and afters. Uh, again, we're gonna talk about that next time. It's slightly different on the bottom. And a very small addition is the demising wall between the balconies uh, on the bottom elevation. I don't know if you can see that, it's in front of the chimney and it's to uh, provide privacy between those two, those two guest rooms. You go to the next plan. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, next elevation. We, uh, would, we don't wanna talk about the guest room elevator uh, elevation today. Uh, as you might remember, there was a question that came up at the last HLC meeting where we uh, realized we couldn't cover the elevator doors. Uh, if you see at B15 on the bottom Revit elevation, uh, we can't have uh, metal doors facing south southwest, uh, so we need to resolve that. Uh, as you know, we can't exceed the red line uh, for things that are, are that, that are not needed. So we want to work on that, and we will work on that uh, and show you that next time. Uh, this is the uh, the part of the ele elevation that Commissioner Mahan suggested we look at the Lobero Theater, which we're still doing, and uh, we, we will again have that resolved for next time. On the bottom elevation, you can see a <laughs> very small white panel above the lobby doors. Uh, obviously, we do not want spandrel glass on a building like this. We do want a recessed panel. Uh, what we're going to do is lower the uh, pergola that exists out in front of the lobby to cover up that band that has to go across for the uh, structure separating the lobby from the guest rooms, guest rooms above. If you want to go to the interior east elevation, again, I'm, I'm putting out things that are different. <laughs> if I don't put them out, everything else is the same. So uh, if you look at uh, grid line C4, the small window is pushed too far off to the side. We want to bring that back and center it in the elevation as it was before on the approved elevation above that you saw last fall. And we're going to show you very soon here these engaged pot details, which uh, 
which I think will uh, be a very nice surprise on this building. And if you go to interior south, interior south elevation, um, we needed to, if you look at D14 on both the top and the bottom, the CAD and Revit, we needed to delete that window. And uh, you might remember my very first presentation to you, I talked about having some inset tile areas. Uh, I showed you a picture, not a picture, but tiles of St. Barbara. Um, that would be a great sp spot for something like that. We can't have the window because of the fire. There's a fire door right there, so we can't do that. We still wanna have something significant. So when you ascend the stairs right in front of you uh, is this interesting tile uh, detail. I think it's actually better than having the uh, window there. And uh, one thing we will absolutely fix, uh, you might remember that uh, those old uh, sepia tone photographs I showed you of the stair that goes from the uh, third floor to the roof uh, on both elevation, elevations, you can see it. We are still working out with the structural engineer, the details of the corbels, uh, which aren't quite right on the bottom elevation and the arcs that go between the corporal corbels are not quite right as well. So. Working on that, uh, again, I'm pointing out the things that are different, but uh, not necessarily um, bad. And then the next elevation, the interior west elevation, this is where Commissioner Lenvik suggested we break the roof, which I love. Um, as we've always said to you, that this building doesn't have to have all the exact same details all throughout. It can have different details and that'll make it all the better. Uh, so we have that roof break uh, suggested by Commissioner Lenvik, and something that you probably never asked about or even knew, we used to have the doors in groups of two. And if you've seen a modern hotel uh, uh, the, where the two doors are recessed into an alcove, it's called a door drop. We had it on the outside of this building. Obviously a door drop is not really appropriate on a 1920s inspired Spanish colonial building. So we separated all the doors and we centered them on the arches. And then we gave a nice detail where the walls are actually angled around the doors. So uh, the, the doors are inset about 10 inches. And then all around the door is an angle, a very typical Spanish colonial detail, uh, which we think would be much, much better than a door drop. As long as that hand is right there, I'll tell you one thing that's different. We raised the solid walls to uh, hide all the railings. Uh, I showed you a bad example of that. Uh, on one of the first presentations, we told you we wanted to have the railings behind the solid walls. Uh, so we raised that. One thing I think looks a little bit funny are the two pots on either side. They seem too high to me. And certainly we'll work on that and show you the right uh, design for that at the next elevation. Also missing is something that we showed you uh, very last time, and that is the wall um, fountain that's below the uh, French door and the balcony at the end of the building there. So we'll show you why we'd like to do that on the landscape drawings. And park elevation, I'm now three minutes behind. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, the park elevation. So uh, uh, starting off, uh, you might remember the fun meeting we had. Uh, Commissioner Mayhan suggested that wonderful tower. That's the highest part of the tallest part of the tall tower there, inspired by that wonderful fireplace at on De La Guerra Plaza on the corner. And uh, that obviously is still there. We deleted two windows in the back of house zone between D7 uh, and it's where the bikes are going. So we do not think that is an issue. Those four bays at the bottom, uh, that's the covered bike area required uh, for the, for the uh, building. And we also added a service door, and it's gonna be hard to show you this, but bet between D6 and D9, there's a service door we added for the back of house. And um, one important thing we did, if you look at the approved elevation on the left-hand side, uh, the two windows at the very end, we thought those were too close to the outside of the building. We moved them over about 16 inches and they are now uh, pushed in and you can see how much better that looks with a nice solid corner on the edge of the building, uh, which we, we thought was the right thing to do. We're also working on the detail between D8 and D12. You can see the, uh, the, thick, the thickened uh, beam that's above the loggia. If you look at two tile zones, the two smaller windows. We uh, think that might be too thick. We're working on that um, and make it more uh, similar to the approved elevation above. But again, very, very small changes. The next elevation is uh, the north elevation of the, of the building. Um, this uh, has gone through many uh, iterations. Uh, 
Commissioner Mahan suggested, we have this flush tile detail we're working on. Those are the grill things above the arches on the second floor. They're actually on the third floor. If you look at the bottom elevation where we clouded out the blue, we're still working on that. We want to raise the arches and possibly make the grill smaller, working with mechanical engineer on that to make sure we have the right proportions. We feel that uh, the arches a little bit too squat, so we're working on that. Uh, everything else on that elevation is exactly the same. And the last elevation to go over, and if I'm, if I'm doing this fast, I do not mind coming back later and doing it in more detail. The last elevation to go over is, or the, is the Port Cochere elevation. You can see the um, columns uh, what on the part of the facade, we used to call the theater facade. Uh, if you look at D7 above, you can see we've deleted those uh, column capitals, working on that detail right now. Uh, you can also see that we, we were able to reduce the mechanical, um, the elevator penthouse is at D9. You can see how much smaller and lower that is and simplify that. We're able to take out the chimney uh, between D8 and D7, which is now gone on the bottom elevation. And then on the other side, uh, you can see a piece of the retail building, which we will present next time to you. And you can see the idea of adding an arch. This is on the west, west facade of the um, pedestrian loggia that goes through the building. Okay, that was too long. <laughs> Kirk, I'm gonna pass that to you. It's okay, okay, that was a lot worse last item, so. Uh, I got it now. We were so, on uh, time until the last item. All right, go ahead. Commissioner Grumbine and uh, 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 chair, chairpersons, thank you for having us today. Glad to be presenting to you the first time. As Suzanne said, said at the very beginning, we are one team. We're all working towards the same goal. And that is the 23rd of June plan check submittal. If you could please go to, to the HLC drawing set, the main first exhibit you showed, page 14. I wanna walk you through some of the details. Uh, it'll be the, the previous exhibit, the previous PDF, it's called HLC drawings. And page 14, please. There might be a little delay, it's a detail sheet. I'm gonna walk you through some of the details. As Bob just pointed out, if you can go to the, the subsequent pages, please. Keep going down, please. Page 14, yeah, keep going. One more. Okay, there we go. Please, let's stay here. As Bob just said, um, our job has been to create the Revit model that our CDs come out of. We are following all the details that he had set up at the beginning that you had approved previously. The details we're showing here is taken directly from the Revit model. We've added a few notes. These will all be a part of our plan check set, which is submitted in uh, two months time. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see our typical balcony details. Maybe you can zoom in for those upper three details, please. So uh, detail number five is our typical plan detail showing our exterior plaster that returns around a bullnose corner, comes back to the windows. As Bob had said before, we have two different depths for windows. They're always at least six inches deep into the wall. At times they can be eight inches deep for large windows. In this case right here, as Bob said, we do have a detail we think will work really pretty well. The guardrail, the top of the balustrade guardrail, which you're seeing there, that L-shaped piece will come back. We have a mounting bracket that's set back into our main framing. It then has a sleeved connection so that the balcony guardrail goes into the sleeve connection. That sleeve connection with a, uh, a small ex expansion joint will allow us to then plaster around that. We realize there might be a little bit of cracking over time, but we think it's a great way to get back to a tr traditional detail. It can really be constructible in an easy way. Just to the right of that, number seven is a typical door head detail. Again, showing the continuity with that plaster is always wrapping around, returning up against our windows. Right now we've been specifying Arcadia windows, which of course is a thin profile, uh, two and three quarters inches, I think is the overall size. If you can pan down a little bit below, please, to the uh, lower and left. Number six then is the section detail through that same balcony. Our balconies are uh, one foot eight inch deep projection. There's a steel angle that's the, uh, the protruding face out there. The overall thickness is just about three inches. It has strap steel on top, which you're seeing in section right now, end angle. And then there's gonna be a part of it, it's gonna be prefabricated. The actual structure for the balcony will come into a connection point. It's gonna create a L-shaped bracket that will be then mounted onto the building. The benefit is, again, we can continue our plaster up over that mounting bracket. 
We do get half inch gaps between each of the two inch straps which are, which are laid across the bottom. So again, a very traditional and typical detail that goes back to our threshold. Just adjacent to that, number eight, that's a typical door detail in plan. Again, showing the returning details. If you can go to detail number two, please. Uh, upper right hand corner, there we go. So uh, many of the guest rooms have verandas. This is our typical detail through the veranda. Starting from the left, you have the actual sliding glass door that separates interior from exterior. Threshold that goes to a zero or a quarter inch edge there. We have limestone pavers that taper down. That tapering paved area comes down to a small curb. That curb is about two inches high. That allows us to have our uh, overflow scupper drain. So we have a drain, main drain for the floor. If that backs up and builds up, then the water, the overflow relief would be to go over the top of that curb wall. Our balustrade in these cases is pulled in, inboard towards the veranda. So guests won't really be putting their feet on that curb wall, which would then lead possibly to breaking and cracking and undermine the waterproofing. As Bob said before, that wall you're seeing top to bottom, that curb, that is our thicker wall, one foot, two inches uh, wide. At the top then, we have an inset reveal a ceiling. That's a board on board detail running left to right across here. And that's set 10 inches up above the opening. All of our veranda openings are 8.0 above finished floor. If you could pan down, please. I'm going quick too. If you have questions later, we'll come back to them. Uh, at the bottom is our incorrect weep, uh, weep screen detail. Again, we're gonna come back and show you a much better one. Uh, we didn't have time to get this all finished and modified before we submitted it. And then typical detail over to the, the left of that. If you can go to the next page, please. Interior courtyard facing towards the meeting room. We've been studying having chamfered edges on the arcade at that point. And those chamfers are um, eight inches at the face. And those columns are uh, three foot six wide and two foot five deep actually there. It's a little bit deeper because that's where we have a lot of people moving through that space. And that's all plaster coming down and then a, a plaster base. We looked at a tile, but this is not a complete detail yet. We're still investigating how to terminate that. If you go to the next page, please. Great. So we have five different locations. We have a stair that has our thickened wall. Upper left-hand corner is a section through that typical wall. It's a plaster wrap all the way around. We do have a concrete curb at the base, but we take our backer board from the concrete curb, take the backer board down, and that allows us to take the plaster down beyond that. So we're seeing plaster all the way around. We do have, of course, a handrail that comes off of that and integral lighting. To the upper right-hand side, if you could zoom in a little bit, please. That's our typical balustrade condition. We have a, many locations we have a higher parapet wall. We need fall protection. So we're gonna be attaching that on the sides and the bases. Same details we showed you before with that sleeved connection, that that sleeve connection comes through and that mounting bracket is then behind the plaster. Uh, the left-hand portion that's just showing that it's also inset so people can't get their feet or knees or a hip onto that edge and undermine the fall protection we have. Now, if you can just pan straight down. As Bob said with a big smile on his face, here's our, our pot detail we're working on, our engaged pot. So um, yeah, we, we took this very seriously actually, how we can get this done. Our best solution so far is to get a precast pot. A uh, detail number show, two shows that. It'll be fast through the pot itself back into a mounting bracket. The plaster that comes on the sides of the actual parapet wall will come up against that, that uh, precast pot. There will be a control joint because it has to be, it's two different materials, two different installation times. they will be trying to work to get that to be as smooth as possible with some very small bead of sealant. But this will stay in place, uh, it shouldn't move a whole lot. If it needs to be maintained, it would be unscrewed, taken out, replaced, and then it's patched back up. Uh, drain inches then in the detail just down below to the right, we'll have drainage coming out of that. And we're working with the landscape architect to make sure we get the drainage correct. So we're quite confident that's gonna work and it's gonna look great on the building as well. If you can go to the next page, please. Just three more details to go through. Uh, upper right-hand side, that's a typical Eve condition. We do not have the rain gutters to show you today. We'll show you in the next meeting. But we do have, uh, we have MCA tiles. It's a two-piece tile. They are flash, they're boosters. Uh, we have the, the mortar bird's, bird's mouth at the end. Very typical details. We have an eight-inch 
uh, foam eave detail that comes along there, the cornice that's plastered over, and that plaster runs straight down. Next detail down is in a typical ridge detail. And if you can go down one more piece of detail number one, that's the typical, um, the rake edge at the gable, which again is the MCA tile. And this model, the Revit model, is not showing them close enough together. But it's really much tighter together actually for the top tile, a typical detail. That's a quick pass through some of the CD level details. We'll have more to show you at the next session, but I'll hand it over to Joel now because we're going to uh, explain the landscape plan to you and landscape concept to you. And it's a subsequent page actually. You can just go down one more page. There we go. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Joel Harms. I'm with uh, Burton Landscape Architectural Studio, and we're uh, coming to you from our offices actually in Solana Beach, um, uh, uh, California. And um, we work on a lot of hotels. We work on a lot of resorts, and a lot of them are on the coastal frontage. And we're this one for me is very personal because I actually grew up in Santa Barbara. I was born there. And my family and I continue to have a home there. In fact, today we uh, started construction on rebuilding our debris flow house. And so it's very special to be um, having that start and to be coming a part of this project as we move into design development and construction drawings. Um, today, though, we'd like to focus on the internal uh, side of the project um, and show you the arrival courtyard and the interior courtyards and uh, some adjacent room uh, uh, designs. And I think the idea here is that we are, again, building on the original conceptual plan. This is um, with some small modifications. Uh, we thought that we could um, just move on and start to really look at the details, the materials, and really create um, even uh, these special moments uh, to make this, this hotel a, a real um, a part of the community. Um, to start with, we'll move to the arrival court, and that is the main entrance is off of uh, Calle Cesar Chavez. And here, um, you know, as we're trying to bring the not only our guests, but the local community in, we have two entrances or portals into the site. One is the, um, on the left-hand side of the drive is a, a pedestrian portal and moves through a loggia into the garden court or the circular um, courtyard. The opposite one is the um, automobile entrance uh, where you break through a garden wall and also enter the courtyard um, immediately. Here you find the circular form um, where we want to use a, a lovely chevron pattern that moves towards the center point of the, of the plaza. You also see um, uh, paving bands within that context. These are actually um, relationships to um, entrances um, from the perimeter of the circle um, that start to connect you um, as you move around the space. So these, um, as you can see, maybe one of the loggias that leads to the, to the ballroom and the meeting rooms is actually in alignment with the entrance to the retail. Um, and so we have these different connections. You may not realize it because the paving also is going to be one material versus what you see here. Um, and we'll just use different materials, I mean, different sizes and different characters to make that composition. So the, the movement is subtle, um, but the recognize, we're recognizing these kind of movements through the space. Um, the original plan had a central planter. Um, here we've moved towards uh, an oval shape. Um, this has many meanings. Uh, one is that it turns our guests uh, counterclockwise immediately and brings them around and drops them um, in the front uh, and the lobby and the ballet station that we want to have. The second piece is it um, allows us to move a large canopy tree off this, the center line views, which um, it brings you know, into focus basically this rotational viewpoints that we were just talking about. And finally, it also allows us to have a larger planter. Um, and we get a really beautiful canopy tree here and it allows us to use that as what we call our green port cochere um, because we do not have an architectural element that bridges the gap um, between the automobile and, the, um, and the, the building itself. We do have a fountain um, in one corner of, of the 
area of the of the circle. Um, this was on the original plan. Here we're breaching the the, uh, the wall and allowing it to be seen from both the uh, interior circular form or the rival sequence of the auto, and also from the inside of patio, which is associated with uh, some meeting rooms in that position. The landscape here will be very similar to what you see in uh, many of the hotels in town and or uh, state homes where the uh, vegetation and the layering will um, appear eclectic and will um, appear has been gathered over time. So we're making use of many different palms, uh, different textural uh, foliage and character to highlight the Spanish colonial architecture. As we move from that um, area, we then uh, enter the lobby uh, is our main access uh, to, the, to the interior courtyard. And here, maybe if we could just blow it up a little bit, if that was possible. Um, so the, um, this space, as you can see, has a um, beautiful arbor uh, or trellis off of the, uh, the lobby. And different from the original plan, we've actually expanded this terrace. Uh, we felt it needed to have a little bit more breath and um, comfort to allow more people to experience um, these great views of not only the gardens, but the, the long view of the Stearns Wharf and the ocean front. We've also engaged a, a, a new fountain into this, um, and we took our cue from uh, Casa de, del Herrero and used um, uh, uh, just a, a flat lawn plane and allowed the, the fountain to kind of disappear into the landscape but bubble up. And this allows us to have some um, interest, some noise, um, the idea of cooling. Um, and then this is framed by two um, architectural palms that start the framework um, of this view uh, of our main courtyard, um, which leads out towards, um, the, again, towards the, the, the beachfront. Um, this is a sunken court, um, similar to what was originally proposed. Um, and is flanked, a lawn area is flanked by two walkways that lead to, again, an elevated uh, staircase that leads to a terrace um, that then is overlooking the waterfront um, and a, a focal fountain, again, using the context of uh, Casa de, del Herrero and using that um, idea that you see something not only in the forefront, but it in the distance. Um, we also have used um, plantings of trees, uh, groupings of palms, and we've also integrated some trellises into this to re reinforce that connection and viewpoint. And you can see the trellises, rather than just being one or equal, are actually puzzle pieces. And if you put them together, you'd have a longer trellis, but we thought it was interesting to, on the eastern side, um, make a longer position um, to soften the architecture. And on the opposite side, we used, um, uh, broken them apart and made them more of a framing element, a garden, garden element that actually frames a smaller garden, uh, which could be used for smaller events and or in conjunction with the larger event lawn of the sunken garden space. Um, as you move to the end of the, um, the, again, the elevated terrace, we do have connections um, that bring you over to the restaurant on the left-hand side. And we are introducing some new um, uh, vegetable gardens or herb gardens or flower gardens. The idea out front is to expand that experience um, to in start that step into the landscape around the perimeter and to create also that, that context of the farm to table experience. Um, as we move in back into the courtyard, you see there's um, now a, a, a walkway right off of the lobby that takes you east and west. Um, and that is a new addition uh, because we wanted to be able to move um, through and between these spaces so that they can still be active. And, and that allows you also access directly over to the, um, to the restaurant. Um, but that becomes our main circulation path in addition to the loggia or the, the cupboard um, off of the, the ballroom and the meeting rooms um, as part of the arcade and, and the architecture. To the east hand side, um, you have an elevated uh, terrace. This is up a little bit because this uh, wing has been elevated a little bit over the streetscape. Um, but here, um, the position of it is um, in the shade. It's protected from the ocean. And we thought it would be interesting to take that to our advantage and actually play with a, um, a, a small gesture to um, lotus land and use um, interesting plant materials like bromeliads and cycads and uh, different palms and create a curated kind of collection that would be a first taste of something that you could go visit out in the gardens around uh, Santa Barbara. 
And I think that would become still a usable space. So we have some seating areas here. And it's a nice uh, transition zone to the eastern uh, uh, front of rooms. On the west-hand side, um, we have rearranged this, um, this same lawn area. You can see the rounded endpoint is now in the center line of the ballroom uh, in the arcade behind it. On each side, um, we have created two smaller courtyards. Um, these are uh, can be breakout spaces for smaller meeting rooms and or used in conjunction again with the overall um, this garden space. But we also thought it was important to uh, provide some interest and mystery to the garden itself without having just these three kind of spaces. So if you look closely, we've created these kind of secret gardens, these little nodes um, that are actually soft materials, DG and um, seating and small elements like fountains and maybe some fire elements. And these are these secret pieces that you can go out and enjoy. Um, we'll plant them differently and again showcase these beautiful, um, the landscape of, that is only of Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And um, that makes its connection through these back uh, connections. So you don't always have to take the, the road well traveled. Um, you'll also see um, in an image uh, that is um, to this Western garden um, that uh, because it's enclosed on three sides by the arcade or by architecture, we are also playing with the gesture of bringing in an arcade similar to Valverde. Um, the idea is sort of turning the arcade on its end to complete the architectural expression of this courtyard and give it a little bit of separation and delineation on it on your walkway to the to the restaurant. So you'll see that in one of the images sheets that we'll be sharing with you soon. Um, as we move to one other area, we have the east or the east side gardens. We call these the garden terraces. And here we wanted just to start exploring how we can also integrate our rooms also with the landscape that surrounds it. And typically we have um, on the right hand side going looking over Cesar Chavez, we have um, a paved patio uh, space. But here we saw the opportunity to expand out and create a garden experience. And here the idea is moving out into the again the soft materials, the individualized plantings, and um, seating arrangements that start to feel um, like the beach. And maybe there might be also fountains and water or uh, fire features here that make you feel that you're participating and um, having that special experience uh, along the, the waterfront. Um, I now and now have some image sheets. I'll just run through real quickly for these three areas. If you could just move to the next screen, I think it's 14. This is our arrival sequence. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, the, the pedestrian portal um, and that architectural loggia that you'll move through. On the upper right-hand side, you see the garden gates moving into the, into the circular plaza. You see in the center, that um, oval-shaped uh, planter, the idea of this canopy, our green uh, porcochere. Um, you see the chevron in the middle of the chevron uh, paving the bands that might be part of that, this really, um, this similar just movement of pavement um, all in one color. We're also integrating some of the um, flagstone and limestone into the overall composition and, and softening in that you can see in the arcade, this kind of movement and, and quiet um, sizing of different materials that makes that experience not just one movement, but many movements and, and moments that are uh, much more interesting. And then a gesture to the fountain itself. Here we're saying that this will actually bridge between the two walls. Uh, so you'll experience it from both sides. The next sheet is taking you to the interior courtyard. Here on the, the bigger photograph, you start to see the gesture to um, the uh, step down fountain that's level with the adjacent paving um, and that, that movement and a, a, an idea for the, um, uh, the trellis behind. Um, the next picture over in the middle is, is kind of the end point, that long, uh, long view, that, that fountain that has a little um, vertical element in it so that you can see it and experience it from, from many parts of the garden. The other uh, pictures that you see or the images that you see are, are, are these secret garden moments and the secondary garden places. Um, detailed paving, uh, canopy trees with beautiful lighting, pots that start to uh, invoke uh, detailed care. And I think that you also start to see the um, DG walkways, um, the different plantings, the fire elements and the water features that might be a part of making those spaces spaces special, excuse me. 
And then on the left-hand corner, just a, you know, a quick moment of talking about the vegetable gardens. And then the drop down in the black and white, bringing you back to that idea of that kind of breezy turning itself over and using this reference to Valverde to close, um, not close, but kind of create a, a moment um, that separates you um, and defines that walkway to the restaurant. The next one is the garden terraces. Um, here you see, um, next screen, sorry. Um, you start to see, um, and we'd love to have all these moments, but the truth is what we're trying to portray here is um, like the, the bigger picture looking out through the, um, towards the ocean front, is that change that as you move out into the garden, whether it's a walkway or your decomposed granite um, soft surface, you're getting and gaining that, that kind of garden experience. You also see the little fountain and you see the change in um, the plantings that could be articulated. There might be even some built-ins that you see in this, um, this middle uh, photograph. And the furniture would change also to become much, much more beachy. So it becomes you know, uh, an expression of making, again, special spaces. Um, that really concludes kind of our, our discussions of the, the interior of the site. And we'll be coming back to you in, in these next weeks um, with a, a perimeter of detailing. But I'd like to have um, a quick, um, have a sheet, an inspiration sheet that I'd like to share with you just to talk about our first ideas. And that's the next one in, in Rome. And here, rather than showing you pictures of, um, you know, landscapes that are associated with colonial or Spanish colonial architecture, I thought it would be interesting to go back and think about um, the colors and textures and the and the, the format and the structural elements that make up the landscape that Santa Barbara is. And here you see um, this work of Hank Pritchard, um, a local artist um, that I really enjoy his work because he, he looks at the spaces and he looks at the coastline and he looks at the details that make up those. And though they're abstract and they're not um, uh, really telling exactly what's going to happen, we want to infer these kind of moments because as a hotel, one of the most important things is looking out and looking back. And so you see these moments of seeing people out at the beach, seeing the art, um, uh, the art show, seeing people running and seeing and, and uh, you know, looking uh, at what's going on around you along that beachfront, uh, which is such an important part of this hotel. And so Hank Pritchard, he draws those pieces, the East, East Beach, and you see, you see those kind of things, though we may not see it from that distance, what I'm recognizing, though, is it's so important that we engage ourselves with this, those, the surroundings. And then you also see the landscape and our, um, uh, of the bluff uh, front. And you can see the water of the ocean in the lower um, picture here. And you see that transition almost like our Cabrillo Parkway and the walkway that leads up our little bluff that kind of raises our uh, hotel above that, that vantage point. And then you start to see the the paint, the the actual trees that inhabit those spaces. And that's true of all, a lot of these paintings. You see the, um, the repetition of Washingtonias, um, the California fan palms. You see the cypress. Um, you start to see the tree and the canopies and the, the architectural palms that all become part of this composition. Whether you're on Cabrillo Boulevard, which is true of this landscape, but also you see it as you've seen in his paintings here um, in the natural landscape along the coast. And then with that, um, we use these materials to frame the architecture, once again, letting that shine and using these, these materials to, again, frame views both to and from the hotel. In with that then, within the slopes and, and the areas around uh, the, the hotel itself, we want to engage and use these kind of jewels, these architectural plantings um, that you start to see in these middle um, foreground uh, pictures, the aloes, the dragon trees, um, these, these plants that come and go, the historical plants that have been brought to um, Santa Barbara. And I think you start to see that, and these become things that you see um, with, you know, again, immediately from the hotel or as you're walking along the sidewalk uh, through the park, and that would become part of our expression that we'd like to explore as we bring you um, our next designs for the exterior of the project. So thank you very much. Hi, right, thank you. Okay, so does that complete your uh, presentation? Yes. All right. Yep. All right. So now we will um, open public comment.
So any member of the public wishing to comment on this item, please raise your virtual hand. Here. And Chair Grumbine, I don't see anyone who has raised their hand uh, who wishes to speak on this particular item. Um, so I will um, pass it to Pilar. Okay. And Mr. Chair, there were no written correspondences submitted for this item. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so we'll close public comment and bring it back to the commission for questions. What time are the reservations at the restaurant? I want to book a table. <laughs> Mr. House? He has no more, um, then I'll butt in. Um, Robert, 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 it's just amazing what you guys and your team are doing and uh, it just gets better and better. So it's been a pleasure being involved in the review of this. Um, and more than that, you're an incredible mind reader. I mean, you read my mind about the weep screeds. I was going to point that out. <laughs> Mine too. Uh, um, let's see. So I have a few questions. One of those would be um, sliding doors. Why sliding doors instead of swing doors? That was a surprise to see sliding doors. Who wants we, to take we, that one? Yeah, I, I will if you don't mind. So actually we do have swing doors. The the sliding door has to happen in a couple of locations, not many. We wanted to show the um, the least attractive solution to make sure the details all work. That's why that's in there first. We do have many rooms that have uh, French doors that, that swing in, but it's about clearances to the bed, clearances to furniture, the interior architecture. So that's why I want to show that. Um, most of our balcony conditions, all of our balcony conditions, of course, have French doors swinging in. Most of our guest rooms that have a veranda actually do have uh, also swing doors, but we want to show what it would look like when there's a sliding door. Not many. Okay. Well, that's good to know. And maybe in the next review, we can be more aware of where those are. Um, let's see. And I noticed, um, I don't think there was a call out as to the material of the um, gutter and, and downspout material. I saw there was some galvanized flashing, but I presume that'll all get changed to copper. Um, what we've talked about as a team, again, with Christine Pierron from Carnell Collective being involved, uh, we have talked about looking at a, a gutter system that's been used, she's used before, which is actually a pre-finished. It has a good patina look to it but it is not uh, copper, the initial, the initial construction is not copper. So we are investigating that, not a final selection. We're gonna present that in our next session to you, uh, but we're looking at, at both options at this point. That's the kind of zinc coated uh, material. I forget what it's called. There's a name for it, but- There is a name for it. She's it I forget it right now too. Is it gray material? Uh, yes, I believe so. It's not, I mean, I mean it's, it's, so it's got a matte the finish. The concern is you are right on the waterfront, so it needs to be very corrosion resistant. Exactly. Um, I'm concerned about the detail number two on A7.104, the ridge vent, um, and how that's going to look. I've never seen that detail before, and uh, there's no elevation view of it so i don't know how uh, how frequently that occurs or how visible it would be but that's uh that's a concern that oh, i have let, let's go to that detail first and just to make sure yeah. we can okay. so pardon my interruption chair but uh, mr bolton's pulling it up um his um pdf reader just closed on him unexpectedly so it'll be up in just a moment okay is there anything that we don't need to flip through that you questions that you had, Commissioner House? No, that's the last of questions. I just have uh, probably one comment for later. Okay, so why, why don't we move on? Oh, wait, we got it up here. Okay, never mind. Let's, let's stick on this and finish this question off. So what, what sheet did you say? What was the page reference? Commissioner House? The page reference was A7.104. I, th I think it's page 17 of the PDF. It should be page seven. I think so. I apologize. It looks like uh, it's crashed over again. So I'll try and get that back up in a second. Apologies. Yeah, I think it's page okay. 22 of the PDF. Is it a scale or an elevation? What are you looking for? It's the roof detail. Yeah, 22. Detail two. Okay. 
And by the way, Commissioner House, so while we're pulling that up, I want to just reiterate a little bit more detail. The gutters are painted to look like there's a patina to it. We understand the important nature of that, but as you pointed out, we're also looking at the durability and maintenance, obviously. So, okay, we'll bring that up next uh, next session to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, on that reference detail, uh, Commissioner House is pointing out that doesn't look like it's a vent at all. It just looks like it's a concrete cap, a ridge tile. I think it's just the ridge tile detail. Yeah. Um, no, actually, if you zoom in, it says yeah, it does mortar, say. mortar fill, leaf span, and mortar for venting at every other tile. And uh, it does say uh, sheet metal ridge vent. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, if the mortar is not we'll, present. We'll circle, let's, uh, uh, Commissioner House, let's circle back to that once we get yeah, to the end of But we'll, we'll, okay, we'll, we'll move on to, I said, I think I saw Commissioner Urbana. Or was that Commissioner Lendick? Who, who was up the venue was up first. Okay. Virginia. I'll jump in if he's waiting or whatever. You, uh, okay. Robert, you indicated that uh, the weep screen detail that we see on uh, on your drawings um, was not what you proposed, but you had something else, and I, you didn't show that something else. It's coming next meeting. Um, oh, well, next I'm, meeting. All right. Sorry, but, sorry yeah. if that was not clear. Uh, uh, yes. You, you, you have. You have that uh, weep screen detail on, on probably three or four different locations on your drawings. <coughs> and it's really important that be taken care of. You were also going to tell us why you eliminated the et cetera off the, uh, off the end of that, uh, that building or the, uh, what? All right. So it's uh, your elevation uh, three on A2102 the et cetera, that arch structure that was on the ground floor, you've, apparently you've eliminated that. It's the west facade of the end of the uh, Cesar Chavez wing. And uh, can we go back yes. to the landscape plan? Is that possible? And Joel? That'll be page 18. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's too bad. Yeah. Um, Hang on just a second. Um, we are pulling it up. Um, give us just another minute. I'm sorry about this. Okay. Technical we difficulty. It was, it was competing with something that's happening in the landscape, and um, uh, we can show you the landscape plan. We can show you why we want to replace it uh, with something that's we think better. Okay. Um, but I do think we need the plan to show that. All right. I can under I could I could see where the landscaping would be, uh, uh, you know, would supplement it and, and work well. Um, what, what did uh, somebody said about how landscaping solved bad architectural problems? Who was that? Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. I believe it was a quote by Frank Lloyd Wright where he said that a doctor can bury his mistakes, but an architect can only advise that landscaping be applied. Uh, maybe that was it. <laughs> there's no, there's no bad architecture there. We have to start with that. It's all good architecture. <laughs> yeah, different you know what all Frank right. Lloyd Wright all said right. about the courthouse, don't you? <laughs> yeah. No. All right. No. No more Franklin Wright. Um, oh, Commissioner said, Lennox, do you have any other? Are, nice. <laughs> are we Are we waiting for the landscape plan? Uh, unless Commissioner Lendick had other. Um, yeah, I think okay. we still are. We're still waiting for the plans. Period. Yeah. Um, you. You. I. I have no other questions. Uh, well, I. I did, okay. and, and and you can add it to your list. On the. Uh, on the. Um, elevation northwest wing. It's the uh, ground floor, the the, in, 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 that lower ground floor facade and openings all changed. And I'm wondering if we have got the best solution on that. It's uh, elevation three and A2103. Three, A2103. Okay, we can do that in a second. Yeah. Joel, can you explain the that part of the building? It's where the arrow is right now. Your thought for that? Um, well, I know there was discussion about this and architecturally, um, we were still, as your original elevation was showing, we're indicating some kind of potential found or planter or something architecturally that would, um, you know, tie in with the building facade. 
but we prefer probably not to have a fountain in this location and, and, and really focus our attention on the elevated um, terrace uh, at the end point. Um, and, but we were thinking that this space is actually, um, we'd like to plant more so and soften this edge of the building. Um, we're envisioning a real large canopy tree here set in a, de a decomposed granite paving. So we'd like to have that structure um, really, you know, stand out against the architecture and become really that focal piece um, in this zone where we'd have kind of like outdoor seating and lounging uh, in this kind of garden uh, corner. Okay. Drop your, drop your arrow down to that elevation. No, on the end of the building. Yeah. Right. My pointer doesn't work. <laughs> Take it to that west end of that area right there and enlarge that. Okay, so I see a palm tree there. I, I, I don't identify other materials in that area. Is there well, a fountain there? There is my there's a water feature there. In this scheme, there we were keeping um, we were keeping that water feature that was proposed in the original. I see. Uh, okay, so it's still there. Okay, it is so right it's not there. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's there, but it's not a wall fountain as we we're showing before. It's not built into the facade. The facade. Okay. Okay. Well, will that be will that be will that be tall enough or significant enough to to help kind of break up that large mass of plaster there? Well, right above it is a, a balcony uh, for the yes, guest room. Yes, yes, a nice I see that. balcony. And then it seems like, as Joel was saying, there's a lot that's going on there that's even more important. I think one is the end of the long view uh, where the stone paving is. And the mm -hmm. other is the fire pit right next to it. I think those would be active areas. So we're sure. trying to downplay the fountain and make it more of a landscape feature instead of an architectural wall feature. Yeah, I'll leave it to your judgment. Yes, I'm I'm okay with uh, the balcony and the blank wall. I think the landscaping is doing enough. Okay. Um, next next round of questions. Who's up? Uh, I think we start, we. Yeah, Commissioner Drury. I'm trying to, please, thank you. Um, could, could you pull up the first, uh, I guess the fr front page, to show the whole the whole um, elevation in, in line from east to west? It was the first thing on the screen when you started. Is that possible? That should just be the cover page of this, this package that we're in right now, which is Maybe one not. of the elevations. Yes, yeah, yeah, just that lovely drawing. And is it possible to get back to the whole thing? Uh, 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 mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So uh, I, I just, uh, this is uh, maybe just a question of drawing, but um, th there are no numbers on it, so I'm just, you'll have to bear with me for a moment. Um, if you're running from west on the left to east, there's two in the in the um, about halfway through. There's two balconies with awnings that are the same. One on one facing west, and one facing probably south. Good. And above that one is a little window. Um, is that and then a, a sort of a cap, a cap elevation to the right of that. If you look at that. You, if you find that, you'll see, at least it looks to me like that balcony is sitting right on top of a, of a, a ridge of adobe that's on the on the room below it. Right. That makes yeah. sense? It doesn't. Um, and we'll look at that. Not yet. It's, it's too close. Yeah. Um, that is the spa behind there. So we have some flexibility with what happens. Uh, this mm -hmm. is not a guest room, so we don't have to have a, a, a balcony right there. We could just have a nice window. But we will look okay, at that. Okay, but it does look it does look awkward, right? I mean, I'm. It does. I, Agreed. Okay, yes. okay. All right. You wouldn't paint Plus, that, would you? I, I wouldn't paint it that way. Hell no. <laughs> um, so the other thing I'd like to say, I have to go make dinner for my mother, who's only 107, but still she needs to eat. So uh, I'm gonna if I if you don't mind, uh, Chair Grumbine, I'll just wrap a comment in it. 
and say good night. Yeah, that's if you yeah, have quorum. Sounds good. Um, um, as long as we have quorum, do we have quorum? Um, Mr. Chair, um, I believe no. we do have quorum. Yeah. Okay. We're still if at not, we're still um, at six let me numbers. Know. So I, I yeah. all right. Just just wanted to say in general that what I was saying about that building on State Street, I think 524 State holds true um, with these elevations and they have since Robert came on board. Um, they're simple and um, elegant and the spaces that aren't filled up with uh, foo-for-all really resonate, uh, makes the other, makes the details, the in, the inc incisions in the, in the fabric of this elevation uh, more, more uh, beautiful actually. I think the only, the only vague um, caveat I would have is I would like to see a couple of things that were asymmetrical like an opening that was a bit asymmetrical a bit offset um but that's just that's a very small thing i think um everything that you've ever brought to us has gotten if it's possible better and better so i'm very very pleased with this thank you thank you all right thank you commissioner yeah, thanks, every, um, thanks everybody i'll see you next time all right see you next time um all right so any other questions any other questions um, uh, okay, I, I actually have some questions, um, and it's about the columns, and there's columns everywhere, um, but uh, the round columns in particular, so maybe, um, uh, well, yeah, I, yeah, so let's go to some of the elevations, um, and I think we'll be able to find them, but, um, and, yeah, let's and maybe we can just find an elevation and zoom in. <clears throat> Apologies, Chair, this is Ellen Kokenda. Um, I've had to switch to use in my computer um, because of a technical issue and um, I just have different capabilities than Timmy does to get us there in a quick gotcha. manner and it's taking a couple, gotcha. It's there's a little delay. So as soon as I get to an elevation, I will stop. Is this All right. it sounds good. Or? Yeah, that, this should yeah, be good. That, uh, can you zoom, be, in there? zoom in there? The east elevation, two, number two. Okay, so, um, yeah, so in this, there's uh, maybe A6, um, the paired columns above there, those are round, correct? No, we, we went to a great lengths to take all the round columns off the building. Uh, we keep it even simpler than it was, just keep it very simple. So that there's very few, if any, round columns left. We're still detailing all the columns, but most of them were taken off a while ago. The, the A5 and A6 on those lines, those are? Those A5. are square? Very much like the loggia columns on the entry facade. I don't know if you can go there, but they're all square. Uh, we we want to keep all the columns in the same plane uh, as the rest of the facade, to, again, to keep it simple. Uh, but I don't think there's any round columns left because our goal is to get rid of all the precast on the building and have it more traditionally detailed. Okay, hey, because I, I um, in plan, is that reflected? Because I could have sworn and, and and hold on, I'll, I'll get a plan. I'll get. I'm I'm flipping through it off the side on, on the PDF, so I'm okay. going to try to find one that we can then talk about. Um, uh, Chairman Grum, if I could jump in real quick. Yeah. What Bob said that is absolutely the direction we're trying to have all square, simple columns. Um, if something shows up in plan as being round, again, this is still a progress set of CDs. It's not a complete set. We're working through all that, but the intent is absolutely simple columns that are square. Okay. Okay. Um, so, okay, that's that's uh, okay. And all right, that's that was, that was my question then. Um, the okay. Let's see if I have any other questions here. Um, I think that was it for my questions. Uh, anyone else with any questions? Uh, yes, uh, Chair. Um, so you I got Commissioner Lundvik. Yes, Lindvik. I I asked um, for some for Robert to look at the elevation, which would be I guess the back elevation. It's the north elevation sheet. Uh, elevation three and eight two one zero three. Eight two point one zero 
It's in the same set. It's right oh, by. It's about six drawings ahead. If you could just tell me there. when to stop. There it is. So that, that ground floor opening seemed to have lost something from the prior set of drawings. Yes, that, that's why we flagged. <laughs> Yeah, Commissioner Lundvik, that's why we flagged this elevation and put a circle around it because we're still working on that and uh, the relationship between the arches on the second floor, the openings in the ground floor, and as I mentioned, the grill above, which mm -hmm. in our opinion don't work quite yet. And so we did flag this elevation as well. And we want to show you next time in more detail. Sure. But if you okay. have comments, we're happy to talk about it. No, I just, yeah. it, I noticed a, a change is all. You know, you look at the, um, at the, this elevation and you look at the right side with uh, you know, a window on one floor and a window on the lower floor. Um, that's someplace that, uh, um, who was mentioning the asymmetric placement of windows, how it would add flavor to the building. Um, you could maybe move, you know, those windows around a little bit on, uh, on that on that far right portion of the elevation, even on the far left, you could move them around a little bit, get a little asymmetry there and, and all of a sudden you got the courthouse. Absolutely, would love to look at that. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah, yeah. This is one style where asymmetry counts and asymmetrical yeah. mass. So I think it's a great comment. And we'll look at that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what else? Did, there was something else that I had. I forget where it is now, but uh, I'm, I'm happy. It's, I don't. I don't have any other questions. I'll watch for the details when they come back back next time. Yes, sir. Okay. Commissioner House, should we try one more time to get to A7.104 and look at that ridge? Sounds, sounds like a plan. Let's do it. All right. Just forgive me if I make you ill by flipping through these. That's okay. <laughs> I'm in the PDF page number 22. One more. Uh, one, one more after this. There you go. There you go. And there it is. Detail two. If you could zoom in there. Yes. Scroll over a little bit. Yeah. Little and up a little bit. There we go. There we go. So is that occurring? I mean, obviously that's a volume ceiling inside. That's why you needed to do that. Um, does that occur throughout the project or in only very rare instances? Uh, this is occurring in some instances. I can't give you a proportion of how much or how often, uh -huh. but um, it is something we're working through right now. And a part of the main part of communicating this detail also is to make sure that we can show that that, that mortar bed is built up. As far as the venting part, um, that's going to, it's probably actually a wrong detail as we're showing the venting while we still have a, a solid section shown of the tile above. It's right. not quite right. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll just need to look at that next time around. Yeah. Sure. We'll, we'll, we'll clean that up and get it to be one where there's a vent, one where there's not a vent. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. also, you know, where those vents occur, how frequently I'm, I'm guessing sure. it's like, you know, 12 inches long every four feet or something. I don't know. Yeah, that doesn't happen. Every rafter yeah. bay needs to be vented, so that doesn't happen very often. And uh, you know, in our, in in our in Santa Barbara, and you may find that you simply got to take and insulate the full the full uh, structural void to limit, so you don't have to have ventilated. Mm -hmm. Spray mm -hmm. foam insulation, yeah, then right. you could avoid that. Something okay, that's true. Understood. All right. Um, okay, any other questions before we move into comments? All right. Okay, so why don't we now um, shift over to comments, uh, the comment portion of this. So. <coughs> All right, so why don't okay, Commissioner House? The only comment I have is on the landscape, and uh, it's just one thing I don't want to see, which I'm guessing some of you can guess what that might be, and that would be fake grass. 
So please assure me you're not using any artificial turf anywhere. That does not exist on this project. Good, thank you. Oh, Commissioner Van. All right. Yes, here um, I am, here I am. All right. Yes, I agree with Steve. I was concerned about that too. I just wanna say, uh, I hope this starts seeking some of the specimens because it would be nice to have full scale of many of the plant materials and also the trees, especially. I was concerned about the center circle where the cars gather at the entrance, uh, whether or not one tree is going to be sufficient and depending on the variety of that, I'm concerned about that too. Hold on, uh, hold on just okay. one second. Let, let, me, let me make sure I'm taking notes properly here. Um, can we go to the landscape plan for this as well, just so we can make sure we're looking at the right thing and calling it out? As we're looking for that plan, I'll let you know that we're already searching for plant materials. Um, so um, we you, we want to make sure that we can achieve what we're trying to do here. Um, and I would I would hope so. It seems like it's something that uh, needs. I don't know how long it's going to take to do this, but I know it takes a lot longer to get plant material, especially specimens, and you're just, you're just going to have to rob them from places and pay high prices. I hope you have a great budget. I mean, you have great budgets for the buildings, you know. I think we should have the same for the exterior. I think it warrants it based on the de design and ideas you come up with, which are superb. The plants are like dressing for complementing everything. The softness, the murmur, the fragrances, the colors, the textures. And it looks like you've taken all these into consideration. So budget, 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 and scale. We are right. making that those are my those are my concerns. Okay. And, and comments. Thank you. And comments. All right. Um, I, I, I love the project. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Great. All right. Um, next commissioner want, that wants to make comments. Commissioner uh, Lindick. Commissioner House. I said all I need to say. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, uh, Commissioner Mayhem. Everybody's gone home. Yeah, well, sounds are. like it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Commissioner Uli. Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I certainly do appreciate uh, the attention uh, that the applicant has uh, has continued to demonstrate on this project. As many commissioners have said, uh, it just gets better and better. Um, I particularly appreciated uh, the exhibits where you uh, showed us uh, where the various uh, wall types were appearing. It help. It does help uh, to understand. Uh, the thinking behind uh, your design direction, and that is, you know, thicker walls with larger openings, et cetera. So it, it's helpful. Um, I'm happy with it. Um, I think it's going to be a great addition to the community and can't wait for it to actually come into fruition. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Edmond. I just wanted to say it's a, it's beautiful. I mean, I, I'm down in that area all the time, and it's, it's such a, a, you know, obviously a vacant lot, so to speak, right now. And this is just going to be gorgeous down there. All right. Are there comments, commissioners? All right. Um, so I would just, um, adding to those comments, um, I would also, um, uh, and actually, if we can go to um, page, I want to say it's the 15th page of the PDF, if we could. And while we're going there, I'll, I'll just go to a different comment. Um, so in terms of the square columns, and I, I did see some on trellises, or the round ones still showing in plan on trellises, and, and maybe other pieces. I think some of it was, I was confused because it was pots, but I was reading them um, at that small scale. I was reading them as, as round columns on some of the balconies. Um, uh, but there, I think there are still some round columns. 
Um, the thing that I would, um, uh, uh, the, the square columns, um, I, I, the thing I would caution about is making sure that you're, you're looking at, and, sh and it'd probably be helpful to also be showing um, the, some, of the, some of the inspiration and where you're, co you're going and where you're coming from. Um, paired squared columns are, are going to be a little bit of strain, a little bit of a strange bird. Um, and so it, it's going to be um, important to really kind of nail them. Um, but if you are going square on everything, um, and instead of going uh, round on some, and even if you went round plaster, um, uh, but if you are going square on everything, I think it is um, important that the, those column studies are shown um, pretty quickly because um, if, you know before everything gets detailed to the uh, to every to every level. Um, because I think that those are going to be harder to hit, especially because you have so many different types and, and sizes. Um, so, uh, and, and there are, you know, and the ways of doing them. Um, so go, if we can zoom in, let's see, was it, is this the 14th page? <coughs> oh, no, this, we're, uh, this is at 10. Okay. Um, so that would be just a, a general comment. And maybe um, if, if you can do a sort of series of, of much larger scale, or you know, not not massively scaled, but a larger scale um, of the different types of your different types um, of columns and um, uh, and support um, uh, conditions. I think that would be helpful. Um, maybe maybe I've written down the wrong wrong one. The one I'm looking for is the arch that you had that you um, that you were chamfering as well. Uh, you were looking at the sort of octagon shaped arch um, detail. So yeah, it's going to be. It's yes. there. It is. Um, so in this, uh, you are you are you? Um, uh, it looks like in plan you're proposing uh, that would have like a chamfer around it, that arch, because it would have a flare that was part of that um, elevation. In the elevation, it was. Is that correct? Are we just yeah. not not seeing it yet? It's a line that you. It's hard to see on there, but it, there That's is right. a line around the arch. Yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I see it's really a little strong. ghost. Very faint. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, I think, okay, that's, that's good and helpful. Um, and I think uh, in general, it's um, very supportable. Um, and I think you're on, you're on the right track with getting um, a lot of these details dialed in because they're going to make a big difference. So, um, okay. So with that, um, I think uh, I'll, I'll, summarize some of the key points. Um, so I think that in general, everyone um, had, was very appreciative of it and was feeling the design was coming along well. Um, uh, as you mentioned, but we, we want to make sure um, the weep screed details are going to be very important and, um, and having the plaster come all the way down to the ground. Um, the um, uh, the the bal the balcony over the spa um, is too tight um, and needs to be revised. Um, and I'm not sure if we have a if we need to call out the um, elevation on it, but I, th I think it's I think you know where it is. Um, the um, there was a concern for the um, the gutter um, the gutter material, and so wanting to see that and wanting to understand how that's going to um, work and what it's going to be, what you're proposing. Um, the, uh, oh, I would add another, um, another um, note to the Arcadia windows. Um, just as a, just as a note of um, making sure that they have, uh, and, and this was part of the, the sliding, um, but I'll, I'll make that as a separate comment, but um, just making sure that as, as they're imitating steel windows, that those um, the rails and styles and um, those pieces are are um, in in proportion and have the right um, sort of the has the right thickness. So um, as you go continue forward with your detail of those details, um, the uh, call the the oh yeah I guess I should add the other um, windows. Uh, the question of sliders where they occur. If you could show us um, all the sliding um, doors and where they occur. Um, with a preference, with our preference for um, for uh, French doors or in swing or swing doors, um, 
the call a request of a call for square column studies um, at a larger scale um, of the of the different types of all the different types of, of square columns you're proposing. Um, the um, tower elevator to continue to be developed, um, knowing knowing that's gonna, that that um, that was a new piece that we are seeing for the first time. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Oh, and the vent detail, um, or the ridge vent detail on um, detail two of A7.104 um, to be revised. Um, and I think that's, oh, oh, and for landscape um, to make sure that the trees are, are uh, full scale. Um, and specimen trees, and not um, and not not specified as to as small. Um, I think, unless anyone else has any other pieces to add, am I missing anything? Mr. Howe? Uh, nothing to add. I was just going to make a motion. Okay. With those All right. Comments. Well, there's no other. Okay. And it would be a yes. I have I have quite, I have a couple of comments. I'll hold okay. off. Am I on? Uh, yes. Is that Commissioner Vena? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, the textures on the exterior trellises, arbors, and so forth, I assume they're going to be relieved in one form or another and protection given to the overhead uh, structural parts. Uh, so they'll be protected from dry rot in the future as opposed to coming and replacing them later on because we do get rot on the members and that's something we have to be very careful of. So I'm very concerned about it. Otherwise, otherwise I like it very much. Thank you. All right. So with that additional comment of protecting the, um, uh, the structural members of the trellis, trellises, um, Commissioner House, do you want to make that motion? Oh, you're on, you're on mute. Commissioner House, you're on mute, or at least I'm not hearing you. Is everyone else hearing you? No, oh, I am. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, there we go. And then, Mr. Okay. Chair and Commissioner House. For the next yes, Ms. Plummer. So the next meeting, um, I, I would just suggest you do a two-week continuance, Commissioner House, and that's the applicant's request as they come back cyclically. And that's uh, what my motion is. Okay, thank you. Second. All right, Commissioner Uli, second. Under discussion. All right. Um, in that case, we'll call a vote. Uh, this roll is call. Heidi Rago. I will uh, conduct the roll call vote. Chair Grumbine? Aye. Vice Chair House? Yes. Commissioner Drury? He left. He's absent. Commissioner Edmonds? Um, yes. Commissioner Lenvik? Yes. Commissioner Mahan, I believe he's also absent at this point. That's correct. Uh, Commissioner Uli. Yes. Commissioner Vania. Whole, wholehearted yes. All right, that is uh, six yeses and two absences. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, so I guess um, that's it for this item. And we will close this item and um, we'll see them in two weeks and we'll see you all in two weeks as well. And meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chair. See you all, all right. next time. <laughs>